vamos a ir, vamos a ir iniciando. So we're going to be um, starting now. Um, we'll have all the people showing up throughout the, um, throughout the whole morning. Um, but just to keep the agenda kind of flowing, we'll, we'll go ahead and start. Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll go with English and Spanish for the whole presentation. Welcome to our 30th anniversary. The way down to the coast, and, and in this case, support the community in Chomas um, in particular. Um, we'll have two presentations, sacando números más o menos de este programa. Entonces, para nosotros es un gusto y un honor tenerles a todos y todas ustedes el día de hoy. Eh, el día de hoy tenemos cuatro presentaciones, de las cuales tres de ellas están enfocadas en proyectos de diseño, presentaciones, eh, dos de ellas enfocadas aquí en Monteverde y una de ellas en la comunidad de Chomes. Por primera vez nosotros como programa de futuros sostenibles estamos haciendo un proyecto en la parte costera. Entonces, eso es un gusto para nosotros haber podido trabajar con ustedes en, en el sector de Chomes, propiamente. La, la agenda de la mañana va a estar con dos presentaciones eh, para iniciar, después tendremos un, un café y después seguiremos con las últimas dos. La, la cuarta presentación es más una, un resumen de fotografías que, que documenta un poco lo que fue el trabajo de este verano en el proyecto de diseño y construcción que fue un parque, el Parque Central de Santa Elena. Eh, el cual después de almuerzo estaríamos yendo, yendo a visitar con quienes estén por acá. Tendremos transporte para movilizar quien, cualquier persona que no, no tenga transporte. Eh, all this being said, I'll hand it to my colleague and professor for the second half. So we have two faculty members this semester. Stephanie Kramer, who is now with us here. I don't know if she's connected. She might. Um, and Randy Fernando was here in the second half. Um, so those were the two faculty uh, members who were leading the program throughout the whole summer. Uh, thank you, both of you, um, for, for joining us once again down here in Costa Rica. It's a great honor to have you here. Este, y los dos profesores que nos acompañaron para todo el proceso de, de este verano fueron Stephanie Kramer, que no está hoy en presencia, no sé si va a ser conectada en línea, y Randy Fernando, que fue la persona que se en la segunda parte del programa. Randy. Hola a todos, uh, buenos días, mi nombre es Randy Fernando, uh, soy un profesor con la Universidad de México. Last day time I Spanish, so don't expect any more. So, I think as Anibal was saying, uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, to kind of be here today as part of the 30th anniversary for the Sustainable Futures program. Um, I was on this program as a student back in 2014, 2015. Um, so I have the privilege of going back to actually teach the program as a faculty member now. Um, there's a lot of people here that have come from a lot of different places. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for being here. Uh, whether you travel from the US, whether you're a community member, whether you're part of the staff, um, we have some kind of alumni relationship with the program. Huge thank you uh, for showing up and kind of supporting our students as we move forward into the kind of future of what our program, program can do moving forward. Um, so we've taken a lot of time the past few months to really dissect a couple different projects that I was talking about. Um, the first one, which is Community Garden, um, has to do with the project that actually started back in 2002, uh, which Chris is familiar with. Um, their kind of student cohort had started or initiated some of the drawings back in the day. Um, so there's a little bit of history there in the way that that kind of project came to life. Um, and it's been an even more kind of fitting um, project, especially for this year, to kind of go back to our history and see all those kinds of design proposals, reflect on that kind of history, um, and really reinvigorate that energy with, again, a new generation of sustainable future students. Um, so it's amazing seeing the kind of 30 plus years of work that's happened, um, how we've been tapping into that, and how much impact that we've had in the community um, in the past and also kind of moving towards the future. So all these projects, um, I think the kind of spirit of that is that all these projects don't just die off, um, but rather they're now finding ways into kind of getting remodified and rebuilt and re-energized um, to something that can actually be beneficial moving forward. So I'm not gonna to talk too much right now because I'll be doing a lot of talking later um, today. So with that, I'll pass it off to our first group um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and kind of kick off the first presentation. So good morning, everyone. Our project is focused on the community garden, the Puerta Comunitaria, with a goal of increasing the number of users the functionality, the access, and safety.
All right, so my group was made up of me, Faith, Jasmine, and Cheryl, under the advisement of Steph and Randy, as well as Anibal and Gabby. To talk about our clients a little, we have Core Cleaning Mom being one of them. Their goal is to capture carbon emissions to help reduce climate change. Another one is the community garden itself, with the same goal in mind in reducing climate change and capturing more carbon. We did a lot of data research on the local populations. Um, we found that the um, demographic of the areas consists of the many like tourists and young adults. This is a, a race map uh, looking at the neighbors. We can see Central Plano is on the, the low risk and community garden is have the opportunity as like uh, residency help. On the thought of a resiliency hub, we can see on the map that um, the community garden um, serves as a hub or a center connecting all four um, neighborhoods like Los Llanos, Monteverde, Cerro Plano, and San Elena within walking distance of everyone. Um, looking into the history, it was privately owned and then turned into a bull ring around the 1980s. Um, after the usage of a bull ring, it was left abandoned and trashed. Um, around COVID 2020, um, the community kind of took um, hold of the community garden and rebuilt it. So here are some interior photos that we took on our first site visit. We focused on a multitude of subjects such as the facade, uh, the interior structure, the views to and from the space, as well as some specific features like the stage and the existing compost. We then stitched together photos of the entire outside of the building to kind of do a little bit of an analysis on which facade is in good condition, which facade is not, where there's no facade at all, just to kind of see where we should get started. <coughs> As we studied the site, we kind of built a 3D model to um, further analyze, analyze the whole facade, the structure, and the bleacher, as well as the roof condition. And then looking more into the structure, we kind of um, highlighted parts deemed in red where, where we deemed them as unsafe or rusted and weathered. And then as the red gets lighter, they're more usable and stru like structural. And then the white is where we deem the structure to be safe. So this drawing of the site highlights existing conditions like the gravel pile used by the municipality, the concrete slabs located on the left, and in progress. natural elements like the rocks located towards the back. And while we were analyzing the site, some of the best parts of the site were the views, and towards the back of the building you get a nice view of the surrounding neighborhood. And just to go into that, so this is the view from standing outside the community garden looking at the view of the surrounding neighborhood, and if you were standing there, you can see that that is the view from the surrounding neighborhood towards the building, and you just kind of see that it's visible from that. So we made a map to highlight the work progress of the site, and to the like the main road via 620. Um, the very like traffic node here, uh, intersections with the uh, smooth, smooth playground, bus stop, and the existing site work and the zoom of the restaurant. So here we highlight the path of the wind uh, from the northeast to the, uh, how it like interact with our site as well like, as the circulations for now. So in the diagram we highlight the movement of the water on the site. The cliff here diverts the water down the hills in each kind of like directions and the roof comes the waters and direct into the internal gardens to the water tank and the swamp. So for the program plan, we have the compost bins highlighted in green, the stage highlighted in orange, and we have the additional garden towards the back. We have the bathrooms located towards the back of the building and then the farmer's market towards the front. Um, looking more into what's in the garden, we have herbs highlighted in green, which is mint and um, vegetables are in yellow, flowers are in blue, and then fruits are in red. Um, as a team, we went over a SWOT analysis of the whole um, project. We found the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and constraints. Some of the strengths were it's well used by the community as of right now, and the land is pretty flat. Some weaknesses is that there's a lack of visibility and opacity, which also um, affects its safety. Then opportunities is that there's an opportunity to increase water collection and util utilize the existing views that's already 
on the site and then some constraints are that there's a cliff, there's um, usage um, from the municipality and then there's going to be a need for maintenance and care in the long term. So after all these series of analysis, we started to break down some of our main goals for the project. Uh, one of the main ones is to increase transparency. This allows for safety, um, for things to be able to not be as private. We also want to overall work on protection of the elements, sun, wind, rain, and various factors of making this more of a resiliency hub. So people not only go here for enjoyment, but also go here for, go here for refuge. So this is an oversimplification of our final project. We decided to extend this early portion here for a marketplace or just a multi-use space. We removed these two portions here for an existing rain garden and easy access, as well as just overall connection to the vacant spot on the left. And we increased the back for a terrace garden. So we decided, uh, just for both financial reasons, as well as to make sure that part of the structure is usable at all times, to break down the project into phases. So the first phase, we focus on that market space. Uh, this space is very important because it's the first thing you see when you walk up. There's already a pedestrian entrance here. And we think that having that in the beginning is also a way to test out some different facade options. The next phase is focused much more on the site. While we leave this area here for potential school and for parking, we increase a nice promenade space here, as well as a walking area here with a playground in between. And this is an area for people to access even if they don't need to use the garden. And the third one is the more of the bulk of our design, where we in include a new greenhouse space, this terrace garden in the back, improve, uh, like increasing the uh, facade, improving the facade to the materials, and keeping these storage and compost areas. So in this diagram, we're using our core models to highlight the path of the wind and how it affects uh, our like site as well as um, the circulations. We can see we're using satellite openings and the trees along here to kind of like slow down the wind into the buildings. And there's like three circulations here. This one is for like the future school. So it's kind of like for the car to go into the parking lot. And this one is the main entrance for the uh, like building. And this one is kind of like a direct like pathway for buildings go directly in the parking or the market. Uh, this is our um, for now is new design of the water tank. So as we can see, we have like six water tanks over um, our buildings, and it's kind of like uh, the water goes um, through from the roof going to the gutters and going to the walls and water tank. And this one direct to the rain going to the rain garden, and we have a different um, roof direction on the market, and the water gonna go like through the roof and go to itself. So just to recap, here's the existing site plan, and here's the official plan of the site where space is designated to the future school on the left, as well as new walkways drawn out. We took into consideration initial entrances that are ready to exist on site and expand them out here and here. We have two entrances, one designated for the market and one main entrance in the front of the building, and we also included a drop-off area in the front uh, and parking on site, which would be connected to the future school. Uh, looking at the plane closer up, we can see that the market is in orange. We have the bathrooms, the greenhouse, the farmer's market, the main entrance, and then additional compost bathrooms, storage, and then compost. Um, going back to the idea of resiliency hub, we can see that the market kind of um, transforms into a shelter space. Um, that is, has still access to the bathrooms, and it can hold up to 18 pods, around 150 people. Um, the storage will continue to be used as storage, but can hold things like as pods, blankets, and extra flashlights. The greenhouse will maintain a greenhouse, but then also we can include the idea of using medicinal plants. Um, looking at the roof plan, we can see that the roof maintains its overall slope that leads towards either gutters or the existing swale. And then we have an extra overhang on the garden that has a different slope um, that directs the water to its own separate water tank. Um, looking at the elevation of the building, we can see a facade change. We kind of use repurposed or recycled wood um, in the majority of the facade. We have steel for structure and framing, glass to open up the space and create um, transparency or allow light to let um, come in, and then keeping corrugated metal as the roof condition. So now we're going to go through a little bit of a tour of the three main highlights of our structure, those being the marketplace, the greenhouse, and the terrace garden. So the first one being the market, located right in the front. So this is showing the overall awning right here in the front that Faith mentioned, so that right when you walk in, you feel invited to the space, and this, the market can then bleed out into the exterior lot. If we then look at it from the side view, 
you can see here, this is that uh, we have folding doors to allow for the view to be very transparent. So you can easily see from both outside the structure into the building and into the garden. And this is just a mock-up of what it would look like with a marketplace, but this is a multi-use space, so there's lots of functions. Here's a render showing the outside. We think this lot could be really nice to be used for both the marketplace and also just for any normal day. And then here we jump back inside. So this structure here located in the middle, these beams here, are the existing edge of the building. And we've extended it outwards and added lighting up on the top for a nice daylight. And then again, we want to keep it open so that you can feel like you're both outside while you're inside. Um, looking at some precedents, we looked at Natura Futura architecture and how they use these um, wood paneling doors to open up the space and create some sort of transparency with the, with, while maintaining um, separation from the inside to the outside. So our next stop is the greenhouse. So as you can see here, it's made out of a polycarbonate of a clear, opaque, corrugated material and borders the garden and is, offers an area for both growing small seedlings but also doing general research. So if we jump into the section views, it's looking at it from the side. There's spots to do research, but again, you can see right into the structure, or right into the site. And we have nice shelving units for plants, for storage, research desks, and then again, that same folding material for the doors to allow for easy access. This is an exterior view, showing where it borders the bathroom, and eventually we'll talk about the terrace garden. With this material, we have nice little openings so that the plants are still um, getting good ventilation and wind is still being experienced. This is an interior render. We can see some of this research occurring here. While this could be open to the public, we consider it more of a research area where they're learning more about what they're growing and not just growing. Again, we looked at the floating greenhouse by Natura Futura and how they use elevated um, garden beds um, to highlight like circulation and easy access to all the plants. And now we're going to jump through to the terrace. And the terrace is located in the back of the site. And not only is it more garden space, but it's also nice seating. So it's angled towards the back where you can view the neighborhood and also view back into the garden from the top platform. So we jump into a side view. It has a metal structure covered in wooden paneling. And as you step up, there's lots of seating as well as an overall platform right on top. And then staircase back down into the garden. So this is a render from outside the structure where you can see some of the seating, some of the platform on top, and the overall plants that occupy the space as well. As for inspiration for the terrace garden, we looked at 11 architecture and how they incorporate plants into seeding naturally and we use recycled materials to um, create both. Now we're going to jump through a few of the highlighted moments as well. So in this render, we wanted to call out the natural elements we are considering for new fencing techniques. We chose to use boulders as a way to block cars from entering the building and as well as a safety precaution for pedestrians. And then, as well as just as other alternative options, we looked into different fencing precedents, again, using natural elements like rocks, plants, and other semi-transparent options, which are abundant here in Costa Rica. And then, jumping in, um, circling back, while we were designing our proposal, we wanted to take into account the view of the building from the neighborhood. So in our new design, we created a more transparent environment where the building can be seen, can be better seen and appealing to the surrounding environment. So the garden in the center is where the main plant uh, taking place in order to attract and enhance like the interaction with um, the inter like the center garden, we set a uh, kind of like circular bench in the middle. So allow people to uh, kind of like more like interviews um, themselves in it. This is a uh, kind of like area view of our entire site. This is like the final design for now. So we believe that this proposal would allow for the structure to increase the overall number of users, the functionality, access, and most importantly, safety. And thank you so much for your time.
a really neat idea. And I also, um, I think taking out parts uh, on the on that side so that people can see the view from from the inside is also um, also really exciting. Um, I'd really be interested to know more about the Natura Futura, to have the Natura Futura and the 11 architecture um, kind of links to, to see what, what it was. Um, thinking about those semi-permeable walls that open, open and close, it seems like that could be something that could be made from materials that we could get from the natural world here that would not be expensive, like Kandagrava, and that we could, could use to help as a windbreak as well as, as dividers. Um, so um, those, are, those are some of the, the ideas. Most of them, I mean, I think, wow, if we had a lot of money, we could do a lot. Um, so much of what I'm doing in my mind is translating, OK, what can, how can we, what can, what what of these ideas can we take and do with a, a much smaller budget? Um, but it's this this presentation, but also I think all the way along the the conversations that we've been having with you have been really um, really positive in helping us to to think about possibilities. And even though those rocks were taken away by the municipality, it makes me think, okay, how much do rocks cost and, you know, what could we do with rocks? And rocks are something that can be moved around as time goes on so that they can help define a space and be part of the landscape, but potentially be moved with a backhoe at some time if we need to do it. So um, I, I definitely think we need to keep thinking about how big rocks are part of the part of the design. I think that um, next week we are going to be breaking ground on the rain garden. Um, and John, while well, John is still here, and we've already put in a request to the municipality for the, the backhoe um, and the school, and we will be there for, for making that, that happen. So the water flow is already really beginning to go where it needs to go. So I don't know if Paula has any other comments or John wants to say anything? Oh, for sure. Thank you so much again for all your work. It's been really cool to have so many fresh minds in this space and like to be imagining what it can look like. Um, I know that from, from the school, they really appreciate this as well. Um, I love the idea of it of the space becoming a resiliency hub. I, I thank you guys for bringing this idea in. Um, I also really like how you, how you thought of what it looked like, not only from the inside perspective, but also from our neighborhood, and what, what it will look like once the space starts opening up to our neighbors. Um, I, I love well this image, like how welcoming it is, how um, you can actually see people using the space and have a lot of green and activity is really cool. Um, I like, uh, I really like the garden terrace, is that what you call it? Yes. I think that, that's a really cool way of like keeping the structure and using it as protection but also opening up to the neighborhood and like, taking advantage of the amazing views the space has. Um, but also, it still feels like part of the garden. Um, and I think you you thought of a lot of the aspects in really cool ways. Like, you you didn't leave anything behind it. You, like, you, you really looked at the outside space and the inside space and how like, structure opening up can look like. Um, yeah, and as Katie said, I mean we'll have to see how we can adjust ideas into like our this was the one.
And, but I do know that we, we've already been talking with you guys about like options of how this, the materials that are on site can help us um, work on making this work. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, mine's more of a question. Um, I, well, I, I see how the, the, the uh, bringing out the space for the market will increase uh, usage of the market. I'm wondering if, uh, if you also expect that some aspects of the plan will increase usage in terms of neighbors who might come in and actually use the space for gardening. Like in terms of like the site surrounding the building or within the, 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 the in the inside uh, I, I, I my impression is the original idea of the, of the community garden was that people from the neighborhood would come in and mm -hmm. actually have their their gardens in the in the inner space do you right. do you anticipate uh, increased usage of, of that aspect as well i think so yeah i think one of our goals was to make this a place that people notice more and also care more about so having things like the opening of that, like the uh, those folding doors and things like that, is meant to invite you into the space. And then same with on the far side, just removing that portion of the building so it's completely walkable throughout. Uh, basically, the point of like the rocks and the fence are just so people aren't driving their cars inside. We want people to occupy the space as a garden or even just as a space to sit and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? When I, I guess I just follow up on what Tim just said. Um, another intern that we've got right now, Holly, who I don't see here right now, um, is um, is signage, and there's going to be many more signs that are drawing people in. And this is her sign. Right, that is Holly's sign, and actually we're thinking about having it right near the road. Um, over one of the, the corner entrances. Um, so um, hopefully that will be one of the things that really draws people more inside um, to the garden and explains why it's planted the way it is um, and how we're capturing water and how we compost and all of those sorts of things. Um, and one of the things, just to follow up on what you said, Tim, also, when we started the community garden, the idea was that everybody would have their own plot. What we found over time is that it's actually more common in community gardens to have it be an open space where people, anybody can come work. We plant, um, dig, whatever, um, and then anybody can, is welcome to, to take what, they're, what they need and can use. Um, proportional to the work that they put in. So that's the way it's functioning now, and it's the way we would like it to have more and more people coming in. And we've made a sign, what's it called? Um, yeah, can you say that a little louder? <laughs> Something around this idea. Um, bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, vamos a continuar con el siguiente grupo de la mañana. Thank you guys.
Um, also, while Steph and I are here, we form really close relationships with our clients and the kind of community that's a part of the greater Monte Verde region. Um, and I think this group particularly had a really strong bond with their client as well, um, especially because of the kind of mission statement that they have to be able to kind of advocate for the youth um, along the region and also just providing more kind of cultural programs. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth and I think just really intense engagement um, when it came to kind of understanding the scope of the project as a mission. Um, so what is it providing for Monte Verde as a region? And then how the students could actually kind of adapt those kind of mission statements or goals and objectives into a space that both was functioning um, and also um, a kind of brand oriented or identity oriented um, scheme that would kind of make Rio Shante um, get put on the map, I suppose. So something that was a challenge for us in this project, and I think the students are gonna talk about this quite a bit. Um, we've had countless debates back and forth for weeks um, about what to save, what to kind of remodel, what to preserve, and what to change. Um, so the spirit of all of that, I think, the students did capture really well throughout this presentation. So um, I'll let them kind of tell the story of that as they move forward. So. Pero para traducir rápidamente, eh, para explicar un poco de la relación que se generó entre este grupo en particular con su cliente, gran parte relacionado a la, a la misión de, de Río Chante enfocado en, en, en la juventud local, eh, en este caso tuvieron una, una serie de, de, de diálogos y conversaciones y una relación muy próxima con el cliente en, en, en ir, conversar, ver, retener y, y, y responder en diseño con respecto a las necesidades o lo que el cliente en este momento quería. Esta relación eh, ha dado como resultado un poco lo que vamos a estar viendo el día de hoy en un, en un edificio que es un, un hito histórico hasta cierto punto para, para la comunidad. Eh, y bueno, pues es un poco lo que van a estar presentando los, los chicos ahora. Buenos días. Thank you so much for being here. We are the design team for Rio Chante. My name is Juan Luis Comerovaque. My name is Nicholas Francesco. I'm Julia Brown. Anthony Mealy. My name is Hannah Ruth. So to begin with our wonderful client, Rio Shante has been extremely successful in creating a welcoming space from scratch um, to bring people together and interact with nature while fighting gentrification in Monte Verde. So over the past 80 or so years, the site has experienced many transformations and transitions of ownership. Um, that each established it as a center for community and creativity in Monte Verde. And the current site is the result of highly intensive volunteer labor and restoration from complete abandonment into its present community crafted form. So starting off, we chose to highlight Rio Chante as a star through an accessibility map. We've also chose to call out other um, institutions, restaurants, and hotels around the area, as well as calling out um, potential problem areas leading up to and exiting Rio Chante. In addition, we have also have a second locator map of indicated foot traffic. So we have um, distances traveling of seven to 10 minutes, ranging from to an hour. Secondly, we have also put out a survey to the community of Rio Chante. And in doing so, we have um, additional comments and other programs to see what people of Rio Shante want so we can implement that into the, our future design. Aquí tenemos algunos fotos existentes, comenzando con la, lo del frente de la casa principal de Rio Shante. La cara norte y oeste del salón de usos múltiples y también la frente de la cocina. Y una vista general del sitio desde la casa. El sitio incluye un edificio principal con dos cuartos y un salón de usos múltiples y la cocina. Aquí puedes ver el plan actual. Y al visitar este sitio hemos identificado algunos problemas que tienen, como el espacio del baño que está muy pequeño y hay un espacio aquí que no se está usando por afuera. Y también la cocina se puede orientar 90 grados para que esté mirando la casa, la casa principal. All right, so this is the uh, topographic map of the site. So we can see in the back half of the site, we um, have this massive hill that literally goes up right to the end of the building. And then we also have the river. And we also have to worry about setbacks proposed for the kitchen. 
So we can see that water pools around the buildings. And as this uh, demonstrates how water is pooling and actually flowing underneath the building with rainwater and going down. Also, with the roof, you can see that it's actually puddling and that actually leads to leaks into the building. Continuing with the existing conditions, um, the wind on the site comes towards the back of the house and with that steep terrain at the back, it actually protects the house. Um, which then leads to minimal to no ventilation in the house. Um, and here is how the shadows appear on the site throughout the year with the sun position in June. And here it is in December. And by using uh, thermal imaging technology, we tracked how this sun exposure as well as the roof materiality impact temperatures inside. And we identified noticeable hot spots that cause discomfort inside, um, as well as more temperate areas around the outside um, that are cooled off by the surrounding forest. So for some strengths that we have, we have um, an established organization, the values of a historical landmark, um, connecting to local programs, community investment, and resilience and creativity. Weaknesses is definitely the, the wood structure that we have, the patchwork, patchwork roof shape, material damage, water flow, and parking access. Y las oportunidades serían encontrar lugar de parqueo con comunicación con empresas locales como el Monteverde Fresh School, terrazas de drenaje de agua, facilitación con programas de artistas locales, el puente, viviendas para cuidadores y los senderos existentes de acá. Y las limitaciones son aproximadas del río, las retren, los retengreos, este, entender mantener la frente histórica de Río Chante que quieren preservar y la topografía. Ahora, este, nuestros objetivos con este proyecto son diseñar oportunidades para enseñar el sentido de la comunidad, mejorar la capacidad del programa y la estructura de la cocina y el espacio de los usos múltiples y fomentar exploraciones de la naturaleza, abordar la gestión del agua y la dirección del corriente, preservar la historia y el sentido del frente de Río Chante y explorar programas adicionales para las fases de crecimiento futuro. Aquí tenemos otra vista del modelo 3D existente y ahora dentro del nuevo diseño presentamos estas terrazas de ajardinadas de atrás que nos ayudarán a este, manejar el corriente de agua por las cuestitas que podremos dirigirlas en nuestros sistemas de agua. Ahora el nuevo techo este, permite que el frente de este, el frente del río Chante que respire y muestre su aspecto original y la cocina también la orientamos 90 grados para mirar la casa principal. Aquí tenemos vistas interiores este, donde, donde la cocina dentro y también para ver la, bueno, para la preservación de Río Chante, para ver el frente. Aquí tenemos estudios para mostrar las sombras que se proyectan desde el del sitio existente durante junio y el propuesto. Y ahora, este, luego comparándolo con las sombras de diciembre y con el propuesto de eso. Aquí veremos el análisis de la dirección de viento y cómo se mueve a través del sitio existente y el propuesto. Y este diagrama demuestra la acumulación de la agua debajo de la casa existente y luego este, ahora donde aprovechamos las terrazas del jardín para dirigir el agua a un jardín de lluvia, este, drenaje so sostenible a la izquierda y a la derecha este, un enclarque de extensión. Ahora los climas de, bueno, las inclinaciones de nuestros techos nuevos son de 1 al 3 y 1 al 2 para garantizar el corriente valle a, a los puntos bajos. Aquí. Y nos, nuestros sitios de sitio para los próximos. Y aquí este, tenemos un diagrama para enseñar la estructura de los techos. In an attempt to fix the pooling and runoff of rainwater on site, we've decided to implement a series of rain gardens, bioswales, and also retention ponds. And in doing so, we want to uh, 
plant native plants with deep roots to soak up all that excess water flowing down from that steep topography. And then any excess water not picked up by the plants is then directed away from the main house and is channeled down towards the river. In addition to uh, implementing rainwater techniques, we've also wanted to re-implement uh, great water techniques that we know Rio Shante wanted to put back onto display. So in doing so, we can see that gray water stems from appliances such as sinks, showers, and washing machines. And in doing so, this gray water runs into disinfectant tanks as well as filtration tanks that then filter into um, rain gardens where the plants, again, will pick up all the nutrients they need and whatever is left over will then be taken down towards the river. Here, this is our terracing that we have regraded that steep slope in the back of the house with. Um, we know that prior to this, all of that steep topography was taking all of that water to the back of the house, damaging a lot of that uh, foundation work and structure behind there. So in doing so, we created five bench terraces, and then towards the top, we planted native trees such as banana trees and palm trees, and then moving down towards the house, we planted more native grasses like ferns, agave plants, and um, just perennial plants. So that in doing so, if there's a windstorm or a bad hurricane that comes through, none of these trees would fall and affect the main house structure. And then this is our little water animation gift that we made, um, kind of just showing how this water is going to come down from that steep topography, fill up these bench terraces, and the plants again are going to take the nutrients that they need. Whatever um, is excess is going to flow down to the next bench terrace, and from there, um, this gives opportunity so the water's not coming off the topography super quickly, and again, is going to be taken down towards the river. So, for our site plan, and to, it shows all the program outside of the building. So, in the top half, we have the new greenhouse garden, the relocation of the fire pit, the water collection system, compost toilet, and the amphitheater. In the bottom half, we have the new reserve parking, along with the sculpture garden and River River Texas. So here in this slide, we have a technical first floor plan. And then to explain the programming of what's happening, we converted the, the kitchen to an industrial kitchen. And then going into the gallery, we have the two new private caretaker spaces, along with its own private bathroom. Then going back into the gallery, we have a staircase that goes up to the second floor. Then going to the right of that, we have two bathrooms that has its own shower and a flex space included. To the right of that, we have a storage that is open to the public and to the surrounding studio. To the right of that, uh, we have the art studio that has this program like uh, painting, ceramics, and pottery. And then to go down, uh, we have the multi-purpose room that's divided by a partition wall. That on the left, we can have yoga, and on the right, we can have uh, rock wall climbing housing multiple programs simultaneously. Then as you go down, we have a green space that uses a lattice method that protects you from the elements. And then this one, we have a technical second floor plan. And then to explain the programming in this one, uh, we, made, we made the multi-purpose room double-heighted so we can have a big rock wall climbing, a rock wall that is big that goes all the way up. And then we made a double-headed space in the art studio that creates more of a creative atmosphere. Then to go to the left of that, we have a classroom that is divided by a partition wall that has that can have two classes simultaneously. You can have MBI and Rio Shanti at the same time if you want. Then to the left of that, we have a computer lab and a law space. As in going following through with the catwalk that is connected to the reading nook space. Another comment about the reading nook space that is an extension of the facade that pushes out to create this reading nook. So to back onto the catwalk, it's connected to the kitchen that has another uh, third private caretaker space. So now to explain this diagram, we have a circulation diagram that shows how people would move around the site. The colors depict how uh, people would move through active and meditative spaces. The orange is active, and then the yellow would be meditative. And then here, here's our design changes from the original design to our new design, which is in square meters. This is for the first floor, and here's for the second floor. Okay, so looking at our first section, this is taken through our multi-purpose space. So again, you can see that our rock wall, we've decided to take it up two stories. Um, and in addition, you're able to see that kind of classroom in the background, creating a visual between multiple programs going on at once. Um, in addition, we've also, we've also decided to put these gray water tanks back underneath, where they originally were underneath that deck space. 
Um, this allows opportunity to put them back on displays for people walking by they can ask and learn about them. Our next section is taken even further back into the house, which exposes multiple programs that's going on at the same time. Um, towards the north side of the site, we have areas like our caretaker housing, as well as we have areas of flex spaces in the middle. And in addition, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen um, our, our space that is double height, and then you have also the classroom overlooking that. And then in our third section, we're actually standing at the entrance of Rio Shante this time. And then this is exposed to the more privatized area of the site where we're having, housing three caretaker residences. And then in the background, we have the multi-purpose room kind of patched with those eccentric windows that um, Rio Shante so loves. And in addition, we have the porch that we rotated towards the main portion of the house. And then this allows for that friendly, good neighbor sentiment um, and a visual aid between both programs at once. These are our elevations. So again, we've decided to keep these kind of iconic roof pitches that Rio Shante currently has. And then in addition, on the multi-purpose space, we've chosen to adjust the roof and bring the pitch kind of down towards the topography. This allows us to have greater control over the water that's coming off of that roof. And in addition, you can see those kind of rain gardens that are in the front of the house, which is where um, it would run off into. And then again, on the multi-purpose space is where we can start to see that lattice garden climbing up the taboo columns. Uh, again, this allows for uh, protection against elements such as wind and rain. In the second elevation, again, this is looking towards uh, the residence housing. So again, we're standing at the entrance of Rio Shante, and you can see that this is the two points of access. So the residence, again, allowing for a more privatized entrance. However, the multi-purpose space with all these patchwork windows, we're encouraging the use of threshold by putting the program inside on display. And then lastly, the kitchen, we've decided to modify the roof pitch of the kitchen, changing to a sawtooth roof. So on this, we have uh, windows oriented towards the north, inviting ambient light in into the interior for programs such as cooking classes. And then, again, we have that front porch looking towards the house. Okay, to start with the phasing of how Rio Shandri could get to what we showed below, the map before. We have, for the first phase, we have the implementation of all of our uh, 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 terracing uh, inter uh, interventions, all our terracing intervention interventions, sorry. We have to start off with the rain garden, the garden terraces, the bioswales, and the retention pond, along with the immediate fixing of the roof. And then for the second phase, we have the multi-purpose room expansion, along with the conversion of the kitchen into an industrial kitchen, and then we have the private caretaker spaces that we added in, along with its own bathrooms and flex space. Some minor things are the deck that wraps around the whole building, the gray water system, and the new pizza oven. And then in phase three, we have the implementation of the multi-purpose room program, which is the rock wall, the uh, partition wall that divides the space into two, the art studio and storage, the, and then below the multi-purpose, we have the green space, and then some minor things are the sculpture garden, the river and bridge access, and then we have the stones that we put in place that really help with water flowing. And then in phase four is the installation of the second floor and bringing all the double-headed spaces to the first floor program, and then including all the second floor program. Since materiality is such a crucial component of identity to Rio Shante that we really wanted to preserve, we studied all that is currently in use on site to understand what we could continue forward with in our design. So around the house, we identified um, various forms of wood, stained glass, and corrugated roofing that you see all around the site. In the multi-purpose space, uh, you have a strong identity in the wall of reused windows. And then the kitchen features bamboo partitions and recognizable artistry with murals and mosaics. So these six materials can easily continue within the new design, beginning with wood, stained glass, corrugated roofing, reused windows, bamboo, and artistry and murals, again, to really express that identity of Rio Shante's exterior. And in our final visuals of the project, we amplify all the elements that make up Rio Shante, beginning with more opportunities to produce and display local artwork in the gallery entrance. 
and additional expanded flexible space uh, for the large variety of programs that they host in the multi-purpose. And an overall highly open, active social space with direct connections to nature and public interventions of artwork that culminate into a unified representation of the community Rio Shante serves. Thank you so much. Crazier issues than that, so I'm sure it would be 
in good hands. Well, for, for, for many of us, that it has actual sentimental value um, and would be kind of cool to incorpor just incorporate that rock in there. Um, a, a couple other comments. I would hope that in the final design, the composting toilet would not be far away. One of the things that we have found is that composting toilets, uh, eco toilets are used when they're under the same roof and when they're far away, people consider, can consider them to be um, latrines. So we hope that you'll take one of Gabi's wonderful designs and put it under, put the, put them under the same roof. And I really love the way that you're thinking so much about the flow of water. And while I really love that design about the behind coming down, one of the things I'm wondering about is how to adapt that to the reality that of a constraint you guys didn't list, which is that this is a property that's under easement. And partly because it's so close to the river and partly because it's an easement, really no trees can be cut. And so how do you create that, that kind of water flow and terracing without having to take down any, any trees. Um, but I, I'm really glad to see the, everything that you're doing to try to manage water and slow down water and purify water. It's a, really, it's a great idea. It also could be a great demonstration for how to, how to incorporate those practices. Para resumir algunas de las preguntas, comentarios de Katy, tres principalmente. Uno de ellos está relacionado con, con un tema de una, de una roca que hay en, esa, en ese edificio, literalmente dentro del edificio. Y el, y el valor sentimental que tiene esa roca para, para varios, incluyendo Katy, eh, por, por memorias que tiene de, de la misma. Y cómo se podría incorporar esa roca dentro del diseño sin sacarla al sitio para que esa madre se convierta en un elemento del de, de lugar. De, de cómo poder incorporarse en el diseño, ese es, ese es uno de los puntos. El segundo está un poco relacionado al. Eh, bueno, más bien el tercero está relacionado con el tema de el, 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 los ecotoiles, los, los, los inodoros secos, y cómo podríamos acercarlo más o incorporarlo dentro del edificio y que no quede retirado, porque si no, automáticamente tiene otro contexto, otra connotación más como, como un servicio bueno, conocido normalmente nosotros, como lo llamaríamos, ¿verdad? Entonces, hasta qué punto se incorpora dentro, de, dentro del edificio y el segundo se lo está olvidando, Katy. Oh, el, el último es que me encanta cómo está manejando el flujo de agua um, en, en general, con, tratando de hacer el agua fluir más despacio. Um, y, pero también um, un, una restricción o un un factor que no vi en la lista de constraints. Um, limitaciones. which 
can change throughout the year. Uh, and I was just curious about that part of the process. So that we know that most of the wind comes from the northeast. And we have like, there's a bunch of foliage there and a bunch of trees that kind of actually slow down the wind before it actually comes in, which is nice. You also have that massive hill that we're now moving, which actually allows more wind to come in and act as ventilation if we need to be the top of the windows. But, yeah. So in general, is it from that general knowledge, talking to people who have lived in yeah. the area? Yeah, also just years? being on site, feeling uh -huh. the wind coming in, just, just that's just what we gather. Pregunta de Fernández relacionada con respecto al movimiento del viento y cómo se comporta en el sitio, en qué punto se está incorporado en el diseño como tal, y ellos responden que un poco de el análisis que hicieron, el análisis preliminar para definirlo está, está basado en, bueno, en la experiencia de ellos en el terreno, pero también en cómo se el comportamiento del viento desde el noreste, cruzando a través del sitio. Algunas características muy propias de ese terreno en particular es que tiene como todo una, un, un colchón de, de árboles ahí en, en una zona. Eh, que protege el terreno, eh, el edificio, perdón, y el terreno en sí tiene una curvatura muy particular, entonces hasta cierto punto es como una joya, ¿no? donde el, el edificio está en la parte abajo y queda también hasta cierto punto resguardado el viento. Conociendo que Monteverde el viento pega por todo lado, pero casi siempre hay como algunas partes en las que pega más fuerte, ¿verdad? Es una característica muy propia de, de la zona. Sí, yo creo que yo quiero hacer un comentario, como, besides the design and What's, what's going on here? I think you guys are helping us, and, and I think you, by all you're doing, it's just keeping a great hope in this community to create and to imagine new spaces with lots of possibilities for the community that it's facing uh, huge changes. Um, and I think just by looking at these designs, I got speechless because it was it, it is so great, um, and I think it's it's. Leveling, leveling up the expectatives for the people here um, to what um, what to look for for community spaces as well to show the needs that, that we as a community have for just common places just a, a place to for young people to go and hang out and I think showing this it's really it's really valuable thank you so much for all of this. Mario, ¿puedo ir a traducir? Perdí la primera parte, si no fue Sí, que, que como dejando de lado un poco el tema de que, de que esto es relacionado a diseños, creo que aparte de que el diseño está, está increíble y me dejó sin palabras, eh, creo que el, el trabajo y la labor que este grupo está haciendo es mostrar eh, la oportunidad y incrementar la esperanza que hay en esta comunidad eh, por, por los espacios comunitarios, la necesidad que tenemos como comunidad que, que cambia de crear espacios en los que podamos acceder y, y cumplir y satisfacer nuestras necesidades. Y les estoy agradeciendo por el trabajo que hicieron y lo que nos están mostrando y las posibilidades de las que podemos llegar como comunidad. Tenemos una pregunta, ¿verdad? Y So it can be separated if you wanted to, but okay. in actuality it could be a, a whole big open space that you can do a lot of things. Yeah, it's designed as, as the full space because we know yeah. the, the multi-purpose is very small right now with the amount of activity that goes on in there and dancing is very important. So uh, these partitions are optional. Yeah. It's a way to provide an opportunity to have multiple programs at once or one huge program. And that applies to every other space that has a partition wall. The classrooms, the art studio. Yeah, it's like a, a foldable yeah. wall. Janet? Um, creo que 
lo que mencionó eh, también el tema de que es parte de una servidumbre ecológica, entonces tiene restricciones de lo que se puede o no se puede hacer en el terreno y qué se puede tocar y qué no se puede tocar. Hay un tema de restricción de parqueo, pero el sitio en sí tiene un, un, como todo un concepto de colaboración por, por, el, el, la, por la misión y visión de, de, de lugar como tal, de Río Chante como tal, y también por el lugar en donde se encuentra. Entonces, hasta qué punto muchas de las estrategias pueden ser colaborativas, hasta qué punto, por ejemplo, las técnicas en términos de manejo de aguas que tiene el instituto pueden ser una réplica en Río Chante, hasta qué punto el tema de parqueo, eh, que tal vez se pueda manejar con la fábrica, puede ser un, un insumo también para manejarlo. Entonces, es un tema de ver hasta qué punto nos podemos fortalecer entre las organizaciones o, o lugares que están cercanos al, al sitio como tal para poder hacerlo factible. Es, es una forma también de, de verlo en, en lo, que son, lo que es el desarrollo futuro. Definitivamente no va a poder tener un parqueo enorme y como lo mencionó Katia, a lo mejor ni hace falta un parqueo enorme, o sea, no hay que pasar tanto en esa línea, pero si ese fuese necesario para algún evento en él, también se puede considerar otros lugares cercanos. Eh, y, y bueno, puede ser como por ejemplo si el instituto y la escuela en algún momento requieren de un espacio eh, eh, puede existir un, 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 como toda una línea colaborativa y que, que el Río Chante se convierta en un espacio para también suplir las necesidades de esos otros lugares cuando lo requieren. Y Juan, colaborar con el clima sobre el plan para transporte. Sí, sí, gracias. Sí. Eh, Aníbal, este, entonces los enteritos de los niños para caminar siempre quedan ahí. Sí. Sí, I mean, that's asking about the trails itself, like if that continues to stay in place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Chris. Okay. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the strategy of the two projects with the community garden having a very clear geometry, it has a circle and a center, and this project being the opposite of that in terms of strategy. It has this fragmented history to it this, that changes and evolves. You're using the vocabulary of mosaic, kind of patchwork. Uh, some of your later drawings and some of your early analysis actually adopt that visual strategy to sort of describe how you're learning from what's there and then how it might it change over time. I would, I would carry that logic further within the way you integrate all of this programmatic and all these opinions about like how do you do parking, how do you do the kitchen, to try and think about smaller strategies of dealing with like the terrace and the roof are very large strategies to kind of solve issues of water and site drainage. Um, and I was thinking about if you flip to some of those, the last two or three renderings seem to really capture the spirit of how the project could actually evolve. Yeah, this whole series was um, very, very powerful um, and would allow a lot of difference and variety to come in to how you might actually think about a finer. So if there's a leak, one example is if there's a leak in the roof because there's a narrow point, what if that hole became larger? Like, and what if the water came into the building instead of just was pushed away? And so you kind of celebrate these moments and then you design these kinds of um, patchwork solutions which actually celebrate all these differences within the, a building that seems to have changed many, many times and will continue to change. And that might allow some of the rules and the regs, the kind of things you can't control or you don't know, um, to have a much looser design strategy to sort of deal with them. And so I think right now it looks a little bit like you're trying to solve everything under one roof, a little bit like this building, um, which is different, right? This was like a planned building and it sort of was then added to over many, many years as well. But there was always a plan for it. And there, was, there was always these ideas of how you would think about the part of the whole. So that's where I think right now these are the most, the end is the most seductive actually in terms of how you capture the spirit in a particular place. Um, and I think that story of the rock, typically we take rocks and we move them out of buildings because they're not thinking that it's like the natural. And they say, no, like these things, there could be, that's another example that I think someone brought up that was really, and the tree is, an, is there another one. Like there could be a tree going right through the breezeway of the building and it could be alive. It doesn't have to be kind of cut. And they say, it was there, we have to build around it. Um, and I think that 
Again, it's all about how you develop a design ethos that allows all of these different things to kind of be able to deal with them, but never through a single solution, which is like the bull ring, I think, is a more of a single solution. How do you maintain the identity of the ring and allow all these other things inside of it? This one seems to want to invite a, a more um, finer, kind of patchy solution, which is very much how it's evolved over the last 30 or so years. El comentario de Chris está muy relacionado a los, a los dos proyectos como tal y, y identificando como, como la identidad en general del de concepto que se planteó en el caso de Redondel o la huerta comunitaria como tal está muy enfocado como a, a una solución única eh, es muy enfocado al, al concepto de, de, ese, de, ese, de ese círculo, de ese perímetro, de ese Redondel o de esa huerta que ya tiene como una identidad por sí sola ¿verdad? ¿Cómo se puede mantener eso y una solución que responda a esa identidad del edificio? Mientras que en este caso es mucho más abierto, ¿no? se habla como el tema de parches, o sea, cómo ha evolucionado y cómo tiene diferentes elementos que lo integran. Y mencionaba varios ejemplos, dentro de ellos eh, uno que descarto es el, el tema de cómo, por ejemplo, si hay un solo techo y si hay una gotera, ¿hasta qué punto esa gotera se puede convertir en una catarata? ¿verdad? ¿Cómo dejarlo más bien a propósito, que el agua pueda circular y moverse a un lugar específico y que se pueda celebrar eso? Y al igual que eso, había otros ejemplos como el de la roca que hablábamos, ¿verdad? no moverla, hasta qué punto eso se convierte en un hito del edificio como tal, o los árboles en la parte de atrás, hasta qué punto se pueden integrar, inclusive pueden formar parte del edificio, y no pensar en, en sacarlos, sino más bien eh, potencializar cada uno de esos elementos que hay ahí, dentro del terreno o cerca del edificio, o en el mismo edificio, sin necesidad de, de desplazarlos como tal, y, y generar una identidad, y menciona que este eh, tal vez es uno de los eh, eh, ilustraciones más fuertes que tiene, porque hasta cierto punto muestra un poco la, la identidad o el carácter del edificio a partir de esos elementos que lo forman, que ha sido la, la naturaleza de, 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 ese, de ese edificio a lo largo de los años, cambiando, evolucionando, respondiendo como a una cosa y a otra y, y dándole esa, esa identidad como tal. Si no tenemos ninguna otra pregunta o comentario, yo creo que eh, vamos a tomar un descanso. Sí, vamos a tomar un descanso. Eh, creo que ahorita van a estar llegando los refrigerios, ya están por llegar por ahí. Pero bueno, mientras tanto vamos a tomar un, un pequeño break.
like, I would rather not. Yeah. 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 The function of the first row of seats is to define where people sit behind you. I like to sit in the back so they can hear better.
So this year, for the first time, we were able to walk on one of the projects that we took on a long time ago under the direction of Nance Scripture, um, the Pacific Slow Trail. And, um, and it was a great pleasure for us to take the students walking down that, that path that uh, many, many, many years ago we um, developed many of the trail network design, master plans, and a number of other things for, for the project itself. We stay overnight in San Antonio, was in mind. The next morning we went down to Chomis. You might wonder why Chomis. Well, we're part of this region, this biological corridor. Not only in a biological way we connect, and we should try to get more connection for all the species that move from up and down the slope, but also we should strive to connect socially and economically with these communities. And so this year we had the great opportunity and pleasure to work with a group of women down in Chomis. Um, and so what we're going to be seeing now is the work of the students in this particular region. Um, so this also kind of marks the uh, first for the Sustainable Futures program. We haven't done a project on the coast yet um, with the students or kind of with the kind of team that we have. So it brought up a lot of new challenges, but also some exciting new opportunities. So for one, I wanted to thank the Chomis community for kind of welcoming us. Um, to their coast, right, and kind of touring us around and telling us about their lifestyle, the way they live, and their culture. Um, we've learned a lot, and we're, it was very humbling to kind of go there and see the difference. Um, we spent a lot of time up in Monte Verde, again, as part of Sandal Features for the past 30 years, um, and also kind of myself, along with the other team members and students, but it was very refreshing to go somewhere very different um, when it comes to ecology and climate, um, and also lifestyle choices. So. It was very much a learning experience, I think, for all of us. So this project was quite different in that sense, but it also raises a lot of conversations about um, some very important topics in the community that we should all consider. One of them having to do with climate change. So the addition of water was very much a complex topic in this proposal. Uh, I think the students are gonna talk about this quite a bit and just talking about kind of rising tides, so on and so forth, weather changes. Um, but this project was very much in tune with this idea of really understanding what the kind of next couple of years looks like and what does it mean to make a resilient building that could last that long. Charles, in the book, we're going to look at what Randy explained, that not only was it an opportunity, but also a challenge for us the first time we worked on the coast. So it's a very different context, in temperature, in climate, in the topic of water, but in this case, no water is not water. Here we have to take care of all the water and other marines. Entonces fue toda una oportunidad para los estudiantes y para nosotros como equipo trabajar y exponernos a un concepto muy distinto en la línea de trabajo, que también es algo, un tema sumamente importante, es el tema del cambio climático, cómo influye las distintas comunidades, y las comunidades costeras son de las más eh, sensibles en, en este sentido, eh, por todo lo que es el aumento en, en, o el, 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 el cambio del nivel del mar. Tuvimos esa oportunidad de trabajar y ahora van a ver un poco de lo que significa trabajar en, en edificios con una propuesta de resiliencia en una comunidad en la que ya está establecida eh, y a nivel de costa o a nivel de línea de mar. All yours. Hi. Hi. Buenos días. Our group worked alongside the Chomes Co-op organization in order to design them a resilient building to serve the functions of the organization and provide a cultural connection for the Chomes community. We are made up of Alex, Sean, and myself. I'm Sophia. And so to give a brief background about the co-op, the organization was created in 2014, made up of women who focus on the commercial harvesting and selling of mollusks. The organization is dedicated to the conservation and sustainable use of the mangrove, given their proximity to the ocean. And given this dedication, they also want to provide education on the subject. So before the co-op, this location was once a fish market, and after the fish market, the land was donated to the co-op by the Kama Pez organization. So this is going to be your first look at um, the Chome site. Um, this is a map showing uh, essentially what we're calling the, the area surrounding our site. Um, this bridge right here is what signifies the uh, break between the coastal area of Chomez and the district um, center, which is inland. Um, as you can see here on this map, there are a number of areas called out. Um, on the previous slide, um, it was mentioned that uh, as a part of the co-op's activities, they run tours to educate uh, tourists and other community members about um, the things that they do 
uh, within the area of sustainability. So to look closer at that tour, the first uh, site that they go to is they go within the mangroves and they start to talk about the different types of mangroves, the ways that mangroves um, affect the environment and the ways that they um, can sustainably regrow and, um, and keep the mangroves alive. The second site uh, on the tour is going to the nearby shrimp farm um, and educating the group about um, the shrimp farms around the area. There are a few around Chomes. The third stop is back to the mangroves again um, with the co-op's uh, sapling garden, their nursery for, um, for mangroves. Uh, kids as a part of the co-op, they also uh, prop, uh, propagate these mangroves and they go and plant them elsewhere. And number four is doing exactly that. They take a uh, around 10 minute boat ride off the coast of Chomez um, to go plant these mangroves in areas where they are lacking. So you might think, how is Monteverde correlated with Chomez? So Costa Rica has about 44 biological corridors. And looking at this map, you can see both Chomez and Monteverde are both a part of the Bellbird Biological Corridor. And as part of this corridor, they both work to ensure the maintenance and biodiversity of ecological processes through the use of conservation and sustainability. Another way in which Chomez is connected to other areas is through the access through Highway 1. Sticking to the goal of commercial harvesting and selling, the co-op has the opportunity to expand their market from Chomez to San Jose, um, and other areas alongside Highway 1. So our, our site our group did a tour to the site and uh, we have a short video to show you of some of the drone footage that we were able to capture. So you can see in this video that it gives kind of a new perspective that uh, I doubt a lot of people have been able to see of this site and kind of gives an overview of the site that we're working with. And this, this that's showcasing right now is our existing building on our site, and then zooming out to show the shrimp farms and surrounding areas of the gold. So now we're going to look closer at a few more images of the site that we were able to get from the drone. In this image, we can see the dock, which kind of serves as the main transportation hub for this site uh, from the coast as well as showcasing some of the pedestrian traffic area on the site. This image shows the context of the site zoomed out and labels all the buildings in the context. Uh, most of the buildings are pested areas, um, but this is the dock and then there is a small bar uh, over in that area. This image is highlighting our, site, our existing site that we are building on. Um, we actually measured this site on site and uh, got the measurements so that we could create um, a site plan for our building. So we used those measurements that we gathered as well as some drone images to create this site plan showing the existing foundation. So one of the uh, very special things about Chomez uh, environmentally is that it is what is known as a uh, tropical dry forest. So what that essentially means is it's very dry and it's very hot there. But what that also means is uh, specifically, um, well, in Monteverde, the wet and dry season are pretty much 50-50. In Chomez, the dry season is about two months longer. And in the wet season, you can really only expect rain about two days of the week. Um, so it's a very, very uh, dry site. It's a very hot site. Um, and so what we also noticed on the site, because of Costa Rica's um, ge geographic location, the main prevailing winds come from the northeast on this site. But because of, again, that geographic location, uh, the site is subject to trade winds. So they get the occasional wind from the west as well. So again, uh, Chomez being a coastal location, uh, one of the main environmental effects is tides and this site is very heavily affected by tides. You can see up here, this is about where the low tide is, um, typically at Chomez, and at the high tide, it comes all the way up to the road. Um, and 
it's something that isn't that much of a problem currently because, like I said, it only comes up to the road. It doesn't really touch the buildings. Uh, this is an abstraction that we did, a, uh, an animated GIF, to show uh, essentially what, from our documentation, the tides look like um, throughout the day at Chelmix. So where the tides start to get a little scarier is when we talk about climate change. Climate change is no longer just something that we can talk about. It's a reality that we have to uh, think about and design for. Um, the main part of climate change that we're talking about here is the rising sea levels. So experts say that sea levels will, in, about, in 20 years, rise by about 30 centimeters. Um, and you wouldn't think that that's very much, but on a site like this where the high tide goes all the way up to the road, 30 centimeters would be looking at flooding the entire site. So this means that the buildings would be flooded, um, transportation around the site would be very difficult. Um, however, this isn't a death sentence for the site. Um, as a part of this project, we uh, felt it was very important to look at different ways to um, adapt to climate change as to not abandon a um, thriving community like Chilmans. So a few of those options um, are depicted here uh, because rising sea levels isn't just something that is being faced by coastal communities in Costa Rica, it's being faced by cities all around the world um, in the top left uh, in New York City. Um, so there are a couple different ways, uh, basic ways that um, that rising sea levels can be combated. The first being with something more like in the top left, uh, a concrete break wall system to keep water from overflowing into the, into the city. However, because it's concrete, it's not very sustainable, and it's kind of ugly. Um, <laughs> the second option is a type of, uh, type of terrace pools that, um, that allow the increasing tides to run off, go deeper, and uh, incorporate plants to uh, stop the, or to slow the flow of that water. Um, and something that we looked specifically at in our design that you'll see later is adapting the buildings itself to the rising sea levels. So raising the building, incorporating ways to uh, have the building meet these higher sea levels in a way that cannot just, that isn't just adapting to the sea levels, but making a design that makes use of it. So after analyzing the site, we compiled a list of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and constraints. Um, I won't go through all of them, but I'll highlight some of them. So for our strengths, our site um, is right on the coast, and we were given a relatively flat site and an existing concrete slab to build on. For some weaknesses, um, we would believe that also being to the coast was a weakness due to the, all the effects of climate change that Sean just mentioned. Um, some opportunities. Um, our site was or is in need of a full demolition, therefore it can be seen, seen as a clean slate, as well as the proximity to Highway 1. Again, this gives the co-op um, that way, a, a way to expand their market. And <coughs> lastly, with constraints, our building footprint um, had to remain, remain the same. Now for our goals for the project, we wanted to support the co-op and everything that they do. So in order to put that so in order to do that, our client requested that we should design, uh, or that our design should include a point of sale system so that we can sell their mollusks, a restaurant with an adjacent kitchen area, a large meeting space so that co-op can host their meetings, and lastly, an area in which the mollusks can be cleaned and processed before they're sold. Uh, with that being said, we also made it a goal for us um, to have a lot of circulation and movement given the programs as well as design for future equipment. Now we're going to go into our design and start explaining that process. So this diagram kind of shows how we were thinking about the, the floor plan a little bit. So you can see the dotted line represents how we were thinking about having an open, transparent plan for the most part, and then having that service space be separated for ease of circulation, as well as maintaining views and having that second story uh, exaggerate those views on the site. The program diagram shows how a lot of the program is public in the space, so we have uh, seating as well as garden areas. Uh, and then having that section here that's 
or sort of more closed off for the service rooms. And then the second floor also shows it's mostly open with seating and having a composting toilet on the second floor as well as a water collection tank. <laughs> So something that you would imagine is pretty important to a mollusk co-op, mollusks. Um, as we were at the site, we actually got to see um, a bit of the sourcing process. So we were seeing this uh, lovely man here in the water uh, wade around at about neck level um, with his bucket to start looking for these mollusks. One thing to also mention is the uh, co-op mollus uh, is the only, um, the only group in the area that is legally allowed to harvest these mollusks, and they are also um, nationally recognized. Um, they, they mainly harvest four types of mollusks, the almejas, the mejijon, the chora, and the piangua. Um, and many of those grow right around the, um, the mangroves themselves, and something that the, uh, as you can see, the guy in the water, the, the muddy hand, uh, the co-op strives to use sustainable harvesting methods as to uh, keep this process going and as well to keep the mangroves from dying. So along with those mollusks, uh, there's a pretty hefty cleaning process that we had to look into um, as we wanted to include a cleaning space into our design. Um, and with a few of those came additional design problems that we had to look for. Um, the almejas uh, are one of the few, are one of the specific ones that you find in the mud, and because of that, they are very dirty even after they clean them in salt water. Um, so the co-op has to bleach them with chlorine bleach uh, to be able to make them white enough for people to buy them. Um, the mejijon is a little simpler; it has to be again washed with salt water first to get the initial dirt off, but it has to be set in a bucket overnight of water um, because mejijones are. Uh, mussels. Uh, they have to spit out the sand that is inside of them and then wash one last time before they can be sold. The choras um, have little hairs on them that have to be cut off and then they can be washed and sold. And possibly one of the more interesting ones, the piangua um, is one of the mussels specifically used for ceviche. Um, I learned the research. Um, but the co-op sells them both in the shell or out of the shell. and both with or without the juices that are within uh, that mollusk uh, when they deshell it. So that's on the left, that process of cleaning. On the right is the, um, is the hurdle that we had to, to leap over because of the use of bleach in the cleaning of the almejas. Um, because bleach is a toxic chemical, it cannot be disposed of as easily as salt water or potable water like used in every other um, cleaning process. So here we're exploring different ways that the co-op can uh, look towards disposing of that bleach in a sustainable way to keep their sustainable practices. On the top, um, pouring uh, the bleach containers that they use to clean the almejas, um, taking them in a truck to San Luis where there is a uh, toxic waste disposal site um, so that, that can be taken care of. That is also something that is uh, sort of convenient for the co-op because uh, uh, they have a connection currently uh, selling mollusks in San Jose. San, not San Jose, I wrote San Luis. My bad. Um, <laughs> so they can take them on the same truck. The other option is there are a few um, commercial chemicals that you can buy that uh, claim to be able to take the bleach out of the water and not necessarily make it potable again, but make it clean enough, clean enough to dispose of, and possibly even clean enough to be used in the model's cleaning process again. So three of those are sodium sulfite that are sold in tablets, absorbic acid that is sold in big containers called uh, Vita D uh, to, to really talk about its uh, working properties, and then hydrogen peroxide as well. So looking back at the programs of the building again, um, like Alec mentioned, one of the largest programs in our design is this garden program. And that's split between an inside and an outside. Um, and both of them have a little bit of a different uh, reason for that. Um, the whole idea behind the garden uh, program in the first place was to give the co-op the, uh, the ability to grow their own ceviche ingredients. 
Um, so things like onions, cilantro, tomatoes, peppers, um, and limes, because you have to, the lime is a very important process in the ceviche making. So on the inside, it's much smaller, um, but we wanted to keep it as an experimental, uh, as an experiential quality of the restaurant itself, um, with raised beds to grow the smaller uh, produce, and to start saplings of uh, young lime, uh, lime trees that can then be brought back out to the large site where the where the, uh, the large garden outside where the adult lime trees are. The second program that we added to this design that wasn't necessarily asked for was a stage. And this is something that's really important to our design. Um, as you can see, our design is very open. We do not have a lot of walls in our design. And because of that, our building already our proposal already engages with the street in a spectacular way, but something special happens when we introduce the stage. Um, because people that are walking by, they see the market, they see the open structure, they're invited to come in. But as soon as you in introduce something like a performance or a special event that's happening on that stage, it's essentially a beacon calling people to come in from the street and find out what's happening. If they're coming in to do that, they're more likely to engage with the space and engage with the co-op so this drawing shows our building in the site context, as well as gives a, a little preview of what our final design looks like. Um, we had some precedents throughout this design that we were looking at, um, mainly focusing on qualities such as transparency, as well as lifting that building off of the ground, and then having that second story being very open and using semi-transparent materials for the separated space. And here's another view of that final axon. So going into the floor plan, uh, you can see that the north part of the facade is mostly open to the street, allowing for that ease of access to the building. We have the market located on the corner so that it's one of the first things that you see when you go to the building. So that way if people want to just come for the market and pick up something, they can go in and go out with ease of access. Here you can also see the locations of the ceviche garden and the lime tree. And then the up, upper floor is mostly seating with the compost toilet and water collection. And this is showing our site, or our, pro, our building in the site, um, so you can see how it looks in context. This diagram is showing how the shadows change throughout the day. So the yellow is 7 a.m., blue would be 1 p.m., and purple would be 4 p.m. Uh, this is helpful in our design, showing how we can protect from the sun on the site. So there's some exterior uh, locations where there can be some shading for people, as well as the actual building itself being used for shading in this, such a hot climate. <clears throat> so with this render, we wanted to show you all our vision of the space. So as pictured in the diagram, we envisioned a hope for our design proposal to become a very active space. We imagined members of the community would come to this space, pick up some mollusks, possibly take a seat and enjoy some ceviche, a show, and enjoy the nice view of the ocean. Um, so in this diagram, we have our section of drawings. Um, to dive into the first one, um, we want to focus on sustainable materials, so we decided to experiment with bamboo since it is readily available um, and easy to work with. We have provided three different styles of bamboo um, that we imagine that we can be used for our transparent wall next to our stairs. Um, so this precedent from India shows exactly what we were looking to aim for. Um, one of these options, these ply blue sheets, um, give the buildings some aesthetic while also being sustainable. And in this diagram, this shows how the transparent wall would work in regards to wind and sun shading. Um, this wall would be located next to the ceviche garden and alongside our stairs as well. And in this zoomed in vision, you can also see where people may gather um, as well as a little bit of the garden area right here. So now for our next section. Um, we wanted to focus on views that people would experience while being um, in this space, um, as well as the differences between served and service spaces. Uh, 
So in this diagram blocks out the areas in which people would occupy. Uh, so the darker areas are where most, the most amount of people could be held at one time or where people would be getting served. And the lighter areas are more for the workers and for fewer numbers of people. Now looking closer, you can see there are many people doing many things, including looking out and enjoying the view to the ocean, watching the performance down here, and we're picking up some food at the kitchen window where we have our little restaurant area. So to briefly come back to this talk about resiliency that we brought up earlier with climate change, um, something that we designed for in this was to combat this, um, this rise in sea levels. So when we designed the building, we raised it by about 50 centimeters uh, so that in, it would be resilient to both the rising sea levels themselves and also just high water events. Uh, like I said earlier, the site doesn't get much rain but freak accidents, freak uh, weather events still happen and by keeping a lot of our um, service space on the first floor, we needed to make sure that those were safe from high water events as well as flooding. So this is a diagram showing um, how the building can still be maintained, whether the sea level has risen or not. Um, going to the extreme even of, uh, with water levels rising more and more, people uh, stopping walking to this building and starting to boat to this building. So I'm going to talk about the structure of the building a little bit. So this is a structural plan of the ground floor. Um, you can see that it's mostly made up of columns for the structure without any walls. Um, and these walls are actually not load-bearing walls because the building is raised. So there would be columns in those walls as well. And the same thing for the second floor, those columns extend. So this section is showing some of the detailed callouts that of the structure. Uh, so we have two different options for the roof, and the reason we decided to do this is because one of our proposals is using bamboo for the roof, um, but we wanted to also acknowledge the context of corrugated steel sheets, which is used in abundance in Costa Rica for roofs due to its uh, rainwater collection qualities. So both of these roofs can be good for rainwater collection. Um, the bamboo roof, uh, as you can see in some of the precedents that we're showing, uh, this is showing sort of how light this roof, this type of roof can be, um, as well as the light structure underneath, and then showing how this bamboo is split into like half bamboo combs, and then weaved together in, into this like sheet of bamboo and then put onto the roof structure. Uh, for the walls, we imagined uh, having mostly wood construction with a wood siding and an interior stud structure and then a gypsum board interior. And then the floor would be a raised floor um, with a wood, wood of planks on that steel beam structure. And this drawing is just kind of showing that in its like, entirety, showing how that floor and column and roof structure all connects together into one section. So starting to look at the elevations, um, on the, on, these are the north and south elevations. Something that you can see very clearly in these drawings is the what we were talking about earlier, the, um, the activation of the street and the openness. As you can see on the top, the north elevation, this is what you'd be seeing on the street. It's very open, it's very welcoming. While on the other side, on the south, the one that backs up to the service road and the uh, and the wharf. Um, it's very closed off um, to block out um, some of the some of the views that are back there. They're not the ones that we were specifically trying to engage with. Um, but just looking at this different type of of use of facade to either engage with people or to uh, to enclose. And you can see that again on the east and west elevations, almost splitting the building in half with those different types of facades, um, with them either being open or closed, depending on which side of the street it's facing. So this view here is um, one of two essential views that we used in our design process that really 
uh, drove our design process. This is from the second floor, uh, looking out to the ocean. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we chose to have a second floor in our design, was because this was such a spectacular view when we got to the site, that we knew it was something we had to include in the building. Um, and it's also what really drove our reasoning to put the restaurant on that west area there so that these views could be maintained. Um, and when we were doing earlier scheming, um, there were a few that did not have a second floor, and the reason we kept that second floor again was to keep that view. The second, this is the second view that really drove our design. This is the view from the street to the market. Um, if that last view was what uh, was what made our decision to keep the restaurant over there, this is what essentially drove the rest of our design because we knew we wanted to keep this market in that northeast area so that it would draw people in. It would be the first thing they see as the market being really the main program uh, that we were that we were able to um, deduce from uh, meeting with the client. Uh, so we wanted this to be front and center, and because of that, that influenced where we would be putting the restaurant, it would be influenced where we put the cold storage, where we put the uh, kitchen, the bathrooms, everything. This is really what drove our design, um, and it's probably one of the most successful parts of our design. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, um, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Copen Mulos for providing this opportunity to us to design this project, but also a special thanks to them for working with Sustainable Futures to give us this new opportunity that the Sustainable Futures program has not had before. semi-transparent uh, facade for when they wanted the windows to be closed, but then it could be open throughout most of the day. And then those northeast winds provide uh, ventilation throughout pretty much the whole building due to the open floor plan. That answers the question. Dicha pregunta sobre el tema de las ventanas y hasta qué punto se estaba considerando esos vidrios, si eso podría ser una contradicción con respecto al tema de temperatura y al cerrar el edificio, si eso se convertiría en un elemento que caliente mucho el edificio, las condiciones internas del edificio. Los estudiantes responden que una de las que no necesariamente se estaba imaginando vidrio sólido en las ventanas como tal, sino algún tipo de, de material transparente que podía ser movible, que podía generar una, un flujo constante de aire al edificio para que no se caliente más de lo que, de lo que ya es caliente el sitio como tal. Yo vi una pregunta. I was going to ask if you've already presented this to the co-op people, or is this the first time they're seeing it, and if they've seen it already. What kind of reactions did you had? So originally, um, we did give them a presentation of our midterm work, um, which was similar to this, but we had each broken up into a, a specific type of scheming. Um, we each focused on different types, to, different ways to lay out the programs, like I was saying earlier, with how um, 
that view drove our decision to have a second floor. Um, Sophia focused on uh, designs that had second floors. Um, Alec uh, focused on designs that had uh, completely open air. And I focused on the different uh, ways of laying out for service versus served. So when we showed that to them, um, originally they gave us feedback on what they liked in each scheme. And that's how we got to the scheme that we have now, incorporating those different um, pieces that I liked from each of those three schemes. Pregunta yo está relacionado hasta qué punto los clientes han visto esta propuesta, si es la primera vez que han visto la, el diseño como tal o si esta es, han tenido algún otro acercamiento con el cliente. Los estudiantes responden que tuvimos en una, la, lo que nosotros llamamos Winter, las presentaciones de medio semestre, eh, que fuimos allá y nos reunimos con ellos para presentarle un poco los avances que habían generado los estudiantes en diferentes esquemas y de ahí se unieron varias de las... De las de los elementos de cada uno esquema para generar un, un, un esquema final que es justamente lo que estamos viendo el, el día de hoy eh, y bueno pero yo quiero extender esa pregunta después de haber visto lo que fue el primer la primera presentación ese trabajo preliminar qué piensan de esta segunda parte qué piensan de sus resultados se la dirijo a ustedes directamente bueno, eh, eh, Extending the question, I say, well, following Joe's question, I'm actually curious to hear directly from the client what they think to see the second presentation where we are putting, um, embracing all these elements from the first, from the midterm presentations into the final um, design as it as itself. And Carita is responding, like, she's extremely pleased with the work you have done. It embraces a lot of the different elements in coastal areas as the design is responding really well to like the coastal um, climate and, and weather conditions. At the time that he's embracing them, like the warmth of the spirit of the people there, so she, she can literally imagine the place that people have in the ceviche there uh, while they're enjoying the view or the scenery of the, of the location itself. Um, yeah, so that she can see that not only pleasing that, but pleasing the local community, representing a lot of what the local community is about. Mm -hmm. Gracias. Richard. Another question. I'm thinking about the challenge of adapting to uh, higher water levels in the future versus building a building now. Um, have you thought about how to deal with the uh, fact that you want to build be higher now, but uh, for future purposes, but in the meantime, it's kind of is it floating in the air? What's the what's the way to uh, stand? The, the gap between current conditions now and what we want still to be um, resilient in the future. So a lot of the discussion around that was initially started with the different strategies of how to design for that. And one of our ideas was actually building the building to be modular and potentially move the building. Um, but we were actually considering that it might not be feasible to do that because there's also an existing community around the building um, as well as the cost that might go into something like that. And so our decision to raise the building and keep it on the site as long as possible uh, allows the building to kind of adapt to that change and sort of serve as an example to the rest of the community of like how you can design for this and still keep the culture and heritage intact of the location. Um, and we were actually imagining there could be a complete 
change in the program almost of how it becomes almost more like a dock area um, when the site is completely flooded rather than being a foot traffic area it can be accessed by boats or whatever. Me pregunta Richard, está relacionado un poco a cómo se adapta el edificio de la propuesta de diseño de ellos a la realidad del cambio climático representado en los cambios de niveles de agua en el corto y en el mediano y largo plazo y cómo eso podría afectar la propuesta o cómo la, la propuesta lo menciona. A lo cual responde que en, desde el principio una de las consideraciones fue que el edificio fuera modular, cosas que se pudieran llevar en diferentes módulos, pero que eso no, no parecía ser tan realista. La siguiente propuesta estaba un poco en construirlo en, en, en stilts, este, columnas para levantarlo y poder generar un espacio de tiempo. Entonces, en el corto plazo, eh, inclusive hay una cierta elevación sobre los cimientos para que pueda responder a cambios inmediatos. En el mediano plazo es posible que el nivel llegue a llegar hasta un, hasta un nivel en el cual ya no va a llegarse caminando, sino que más bien se llegaría a través de un bote. Eh, Debo de, de, de ampliar y mencionar que eso fue un, un, un tema bastante nuevo para nosotros y que estuvimos explorando mucho las diferentes realidades. Porque al igual que Chomes, hay muchas comunidades costeras que están prácticamente a nivel del mar. Y la realidad es que pensar en que toda esta comunidad, este vecindario, se va a mover de ahí en el corto plazo, que el gobierno va a tener los recursos para hacerlo, no va a ocurrir. Entonces, ¿cómo se adapta una comunidad? a un cambio que es eminente, que va a pasar. Es cuestión de, puede ser uno, dos, tres, puede ser cinco años, o puede ser veinte años, pero va a ir ocurriendo. Entonces, ir pensando en, en ideas de cómo las comunidades y los edificios responden a esas, a esas condiciones. En algunas comunidades nuestras en el país, en las partes donde se llena, eh, cerca de los ríos, ya se construyen columnas hace muchos años, o sea, no es nada nuevo, en comunidades costeras también, en algunos casos lo han hecho. Entonces, tal vez retomando un poco lo que ya han sido prácticas ancestrales y cómo se puede incorporar a, a este tipo de centros. Extending a bit more of saying like the discussion, and for us this is new, like working in coastal areas is something new, but the reality of communities that have exactly the same condition, um, there is not necessarily money or resources by the Hmong government to move to an entire neighborhood. It's so most likely they'll be there until they can't not be there. Um, so how do we respond with a design that might you know, follow the, the idea of building a stilts um, so that people can access these buildings with boats, for example, uh, um, and, and try to extend the time where they can actually be in, or use this, these buildings itself? Um, Jenny? Um, I love the presentation. It was great. I thought there, there were a couple of things there that you were addressing, particularly the one with the chemicals that are needed to clean the mollusks. And, and that's, that's really important that you, you tried to find alternatives for that. So that's really good. Um, but the other question that I had about that is the differences in the two roofs. And if you did one of those heat analysis things of the difference between what the sink would do and that that bamboo would do, and if there was a big difference between what the two types of materials might make in terms of, of heat within inside the building. So we, did, we didn't end up doing a, a heat analysis of the building, but you are right, like the steel structure, um, that's why the steel was sort of an option that wasn't preferred by us, but it was still given as a cheaper option, most likely in the neighborhood, because that's what's existing there, that's the culture around it. Um, but the bamboo would probably serve as a better option sustainably, um, as well as for the temperature of the roof as well. Um, as that option if they were to tackle that challenge. Se le han preguntado, bueno, menciona dos, dos aspectos, uno de ellos, eh, la importancia y el hecho de que ellos tomaran el tiempo para analizar todo lo que son los químicos que se usan para analizar las ameras o los diferentes tipos de coches que se preparan y alternativas a eso que pueda reducir la contaminación eh, a partir de, de, de otras alternativas. El segundo está relacionado a más una pregunta relacionado al, al material del techo como tal, si hicieron si, si algún análisis por ejemplo de cambios de temperatura, si se usa zinc eh, galvanizado metálico versus utilizar materiales como lo mostraron ellos, el bambú o otros materiales, si había un análisis de, desde el punto de vista de temperatura y cómo, cómo se comportaba eso. A lo cual Alex responde que eh, no, fue, no se hizo un análisis de temperatura, más aún que eh, se presentó siempre la opción de un techo metálico porque es como la cultura local, lo que la mayoría de gente usa para construir, 
más aún otros materiales naturales como podrían ser fibras o, o en este caso un bambú eh, muy, muy puntualmente podrían responder mucho mejor a temas de, de temperatura que no podría ser en, en sí ¿verdad? igual ustedes vieron más o menos también el elemento estético que hace muy, muy distinto ¿verdad? muy bonito Yes. So I know that you guys tackle resiliency and climate change with, within your corporate. I want to ask, was there any other opportunities outside of your corporate that you guys could do to tackle climate change so that potentially the whole place doesn't have to be flooded, like per se, retaining walls or either raising all of the buildings up? So that is something, um, but when I was talking about the different um, strategies, that's why I brought up those uh, the types of environmental um, uh, interventions, uh, like the retaining wall, um, like the project in New York, um, and like those uh, terrace pools. Um, it's not something that we've explored directly in our design, but we wanted to include them in the presentation to um, educate about those different types of interventions with the, with the environment, so that that is something that um, the community of Chumis could look into as something that they can take on themselves. The question is related to the scale of the building, but more like the region, they would analyze other proposals that could be functional at the level of the university as well to manage the climate change at the level of the level of water, or at the level of the level of the level of water, for example, the level of barriers, natural or artificial, that could help or reduce the impact en, en, en el vecindario conforme el nivel del agua vaya subiendo y dice que a pesar de que no lo hicieron para todo el vecindario sí se mencionaron algunas de estas opciones como para tenerlo ahí en la presentación y reflejar de que existen alternativas de que hay eh, otras comunidades a nivel del mundo que están haciendo algunas distintas medidas sean naturales o, o artificiales para poder eh, mitigar los impactos que tiene eso tuvimos un par de semanas atrás una presentación muy interesante eh, justamente hablaba de esto sobre tema, comunidades costeras eh, y cómo diferentes lugares en el mundo están, están tratando de manejar eso. Uno de ellos, de hecho, tiene que ver mucho con lo que ya ellos están haciendo, que es el tema de proteger los manglares. Es, es, un, es un aspecto, un elemento muy importante en las comunidades en las que hay manglar. Se convierte en un elemento natural que evita que, las, que, las, que los golpes, las tormentas, por ejemplo, tropicales, afecten directamente a esas comunidades. Eh, también tratan de ganar un poco más de terreno en entre comillas, a partir de otros elementos naturales y es algo que tenemos que ir explorando mucho más y conociendo más cuál es el comportamiento conocemos muy poco sobre los bosques a nivel de costa y muchas veces más bien los hemos cortado o sea, la ignorancia de los algo hemos ido desarmando muchos espacios de, de, de zonas en, en que naturalmente habían manglares y ahora pues nos damos cuenta de la importancia de ellos We extend in the comment and say not only that but it's important to acknowledge you know, that other parts of the world people are dealing with this, and in some cases it's about knowing more about our natural elements of the coast, mangrove forests, at least here in Costa Rica in many cases we have taken them down um, to build structures around and we are now realizing the importance of mangroves. Um, our clients are actually taking a step forward in that sense of Latin and reforesting, uh, which is an important thing when you're thinking about tropical storms and how that can affect their communities immediately. Um, so that might be something to explore in a study further down the road. Una última pregunta para ir cerrando. Si no, muchas gracias, chicos.
going out and taking on a coastal project with the students. Um, starting up the Central Park build, which is gathering a lot of energy and excitement. Um, so, again, Anibal and Gabby have been spearheading that, um, kind of in the background, along with running the Sustainable Futures program. So it's been a very daunting task for all of us, but somehow we managed to get to the end safely, um, and energetically, and very passionately. So I'm also grateful for the students for kind of bearing with us through this process, um, because there's a lot of work on their end to kind of make this happen too. So. Uh, this is a very huge milestone, I think, for the community and also for the program to kind of come back and circle back to really kind of investigating what this project means for all of us. Resuming un poco lo que Randy dice, sí, ha sido definitivamente todo un un tema este año que ha sido un reto. Hemos tenido el apoyo de muchas personas y muchas de la novia Randy que nos acompaña el día de hoy. Eh, los estudiantes por su paciencia en, en un año en el cual tratamos de conjuntar muchos elementos eh, incluyendo este, el aniversario del programa un montón de ex estudiantes y ex profesores que nos están acompañando y toda la preparación que ha la primera vez haciendo un proyecto en la parte costera y retomando el proyecto del Parque Central de Santa Elena entonces fueron muchas cosas a la vez nos vivimos en múltiples partes y en parte del trabajo de Randy y de Gaby mi persona y un montón, un equipo grandísimo de apoyo que tuvimos, del cual vamos a ahora ver nombres y, y, y bueno, instituciones y empresas que nos apoyaron para que eso fuera posible, eh, para poder llegar a lo que vamos a estar presentando el, el día de hoy. Bueno, so I had the daunting task of somehow becoming the spokesperson for this, so I don't know how that happened. Uh, <laughs> so I'll hold your comments till the end, but we'll kind of walk through a couple of different things in this. For one, just recapping. A lot of the work that's happened very quickly over the past two months, um, and then some ideas we've had and things that we're trying to speculate for the future of what that park might look like um, in its kind of completed form. So this was the original proposal back from 2017. So similar to kind of the bull ring conversation, um, it was another sustainable futures project that got pitched a couple of years ago. Um, and has finally kind of found its way into production. So it's a monumental um, kind of event for us, really, because it talks about this idea of the 30 kind of plus anniversary very well in the sense that we're able to go back to work that we've already done and actually kind of make it a reality. And this is one of those projects that have taken a lot of time and effort from multiple kind of parties of students. Um, and to see that kind of become realized this year uh, is an amazing feat. <laughs> So, this is the existing site as of July 12, 2023. Um, so, as in typical Monte Verde tradition, um, we bring a backhoe onto the site and we start digging. So, there was a lot of work that just started almost immediately, and again, thanks to a lot of people, uh, between the students and the communities gathering to actually clean up the site, uh, we finally had a blank slate to start from. Um, so with this, we kind of moved forward into things that we could intervene with um, safely and securely and kind of with ease as a part of the program as we're tackling all these other kind of topics in the studio. So the first to recap are going to be the play structures that we've been able to build over the past few weeks. Um, the first one focuses on climbing and bouncing. Um, so we focused on a couple of different actions for each of the play structures. So this one, again specifically, was two actions, climbing and bouncing. And we took some inspiration from things that we've already done in the past. So if you guys know about a lot of our projects in the past six to seven years, we've gotten really good at building play structures that are very effective for the community. The kids love them. Um, so this is a project that happened last year in Padre Bonito. Um, so using kind of different elements of donated and recycled um, steel and piping to be able to create structures that people could actually kind of ascend on. Um, so we are very much in the spirit of repurposing and reusing materials. So with that, we started what's called the Bouncy Bridge. The Bouncy Bridge um, sits between 3 meters to 6 meters tall in structure. So it is massive. You guys will see it very clearly as we get to the site later this afternoon. Um, and it extends about 20 meters in span. So the first section is an actual bridge, and then the second half of it 
Um, thankful for the kind of company that's been donating materials and their services has created a zip line um, to the other half of the site. So we started thinking about things like suspension bridges, uh, bridges that kind of already exist in a lot of the reserves. Um, and how much kind of children have fun just being able to move up and down these bridges and kind of feel the movement. So that drew a lot of inspiration for kind of connecting two different types of activities. Uh, one more casual, which is using it as a way to kind of cross over, and the other um, serving as essentially the destination from the zip line kind of platform. So again, you can see one of the workers starting to kind of put this up two weeks ago. And then the second structure, uh, the action was swinging and chilling. Um, as a lot of <laughs> the youth uses in terms of terminology. So the idea is just to kind of um, hang out, socialize, um, use it as a space for gathering for the youth so they could also just talk to each other. So this was inspired by using very light frame structures um, as a way, again, to source material that was already around us that we could get kind of in plenty and create a series of swings or kind of restful or repose um, interventions that, again, the kind of the youth and children can hang out in. Another project uh, from a previous Sustainable Futures build that we took inspiration from, so a tire swing, um, kind of depicting this idea of lounging and kind of recreation. The final piece or final design ended up becoming this. So it's a series of multiple different swings. So we have four that are kind of gathered around this social area. Um, a series of benches as the kind of core of that in, uh, intervention as a way to create something that's for play but also for socialization. And this was a shot again from about two weeks ago. Uh, the structure is getting painted. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done in the past couple of weeks to get it to what you're going to see when you go on the kind of build tour. Uh, later this afternoon to go see the project. So I'm not going to spoil it with any kind of final photos, but this was something from uh, the process in which the students took on to kind of finalize a lot of the steel structure. The third project being climbing and balancing. Um, so we love, I always say this wrong because I say taboo, but it's taboo. Um, taboo's a game. <laughs> also fun. Um, so we took a lot of inspiration from using found material again and kind of repurposed and donated material and we used taboo a lot in our structures because it's very plentiful, it's very easy to source, it's very structural, um, it's very dynamic and organic in the way that we can assemble it together. So these preliminary sketches, the students wanted to focus on an idea of creating a nest. Um, so the notion was that the park kind of served as a way to create an open landscape and we'll get to the site design in a little bit, um, but we also want to create a place for, again, kind of repose and reflection and security and safety for the children. Because children love to hide, we found out. Adults also love to hide. <laughs> um, so we wanted to create a place, again, that kind of multiple ages um, and age groups can occupy and kind of just use as a way to just kind of separate themselves from the outside environment. So they started to develop a nest kind of concept. So the objective was to kind of use this found uh, material, kind of taboo that we have laying around. <laughs> That's the group when they finally were able to pull the structure together. <laughs> and then classic Ani ball with the chainsaw just walking <laughs> It's a baby now. All right, so I have the pleasure of just showing you guys a lot of new things that no one has seen yet. Um, because it happened very recently, as most things do. So we kind of started with putting the structures onto the site, and now we've taken a step back to reflect um, on what the final design might be able to look like um, as we continue to pursue the kind of termination of the project. So again, through a lot of painstaking effort um, and the kind of background of the program, um, we started to develop what's called a master plan to kind of guide decision making for the site as we move forward. So this is the existing site condition. The red um, that's highlighted is our current boundary. So I'm going to break this down even further to kind of locate where we are. The first thing that we did was just understand terrain and topography. So we did a 3D drone scan of the site. And the red kind of being the peak point 
and then the blue being the low point, um, we started to assess what was happening with water. So a kind of topic of interest for this particular site um, had to do with water management and dealing with the water laws. So we weren't able to just say that we were gonna push water off site, but rather we took the attitude of how to keep it um, on site through very passive strategies that, again, MVI has already been kind of executing on their own campus. So this is the terrain and plan. So you can see the kind of big highlighted moments in which there's a very high point that exists in this plateau. We have a low point that reaches the bottom of our site here. And then we have this very big slope that exists in between um, that we started to conceptualize as a way to transfer people and also water. So this is the current site after excavation and kind of processing. And through some more analysis work, um, we started curating, again, directionality for the, where the water was traveling. So we have two kind of major arteries that are taking water um, off-site currently. And we want to change that narrative to actually maintain that water on-site. So one of them being this kind of channel that exists down to the south. And then this big swatch um, or slope that exists on the north side, both of which are terminating again at a low point here and then moving off-site out of the road. So the idea was to like look at this diagram and say, well, what, we can do, what can we do better with the design? And the objective was to kind of use that plateau at the end as a way to actually collect water, treat water, um, and maintain it on-site, and also slow it down through a couple of different interventions um, throughout the kind of landscaping features as we develop the park moving forward. So the first step uh, is to kind of keep and maintain the topography of the site as it is so we can do minimal intervention on the topography. So there's already been a lot of work done onto the site, so the goal at this point now is to kind of create additions that further amplify the performance. The first step being grass. So right now it still looks like a construction site unfortunately. But we're hoping, again, that after we plant a lot of this grass, uh, we can kind of create this great lawn feature for the community that kind of exhibits uh, the spirit of what the Central Park wants to be. So the things that are existing on the site right now are the bridge, again, which span about 20 meters along this southern um, site boundary. We have the taboo structure, taboo structure that exists on the plateau up here. And then we have the swings nestled back into kind of can canopy towards uh, the further kind of south portion of the site. Something to kind of take the spirit of the 2017 proposal further uh, was to incorporate a tear seating uh, zone. So the right side of the site, again, um, kind of documents a location that we can utilize to gather people in a more productive manner. So we've created essentially permeable paving for this kind of center circle um, as a place to gather, also for performance and theater and kind of um, interactions with multiple purposes of activity. And then creating more sustainable kind of terraces um, that essentially surround this platform um, as a way to again look down on that performance area, but also create views outwards. So this is a drawing of the kind of schematic for the way that we're thinking about the terracing. Um, so that permeable kind of pavement that we had seen in that circle um, is meant to actually collect all of that water, similar to kind of how a retention pond works, um, and then uses a drainage pipe for overflow after any kind of flooding events. So some inspiration from the past um, that we've seen in other park projects to create the terracing. Um, came from either using recycled kind of tires as a way to create that stepping. Another option for this um, kind of gets more design oriented. So in this scenario, when we look at this precedent, it focuses on pavers, but we wanted to translate the geometry of this into the park, uh, but not necessarily materials. So the material choices that we shifted towards, we're using things that again, we've already used in the past as a part of the previous parks. So this is a, an example from one of the schools, I think it's Sinai, Sensenai. 
Um, and we use big stones and boulders that have kind of become a thematic, again, a lot of studio presentations, um, as a way to slow down water and also create these kind of bench seating um, for the public. Another example from a park, I think also in San Luis, um, that uses big boulders as a way to create that stepping, but also provide seating for the public. And so this is a kind of concept art image to kind of describe this idea of what we're thinking about for the terracing project. So the objective is again to create kind of a central gathering space, but use local stones and boulders and rocks um, as ways to actually build up the terracing um, for this kind of gathering location while being surrounded again by the local ecology. The next element that we started to kind of dive into was this idea of creating a promenade from the parking lot to the other end of the site. So just a place to kind of walk very slowly and again to reflect, because um, there are a lot of locations in which there aren't really flat spots to walk. <laughs> Um, so rather than being challenged by the terrain, we wanted to create, a, again, a kind of more relaxing promenade feature that features a, essentially an alley of trees. Um, so it's a very common practice in a lot of locations. Uh, I haven't seen too much of it here, so we thought it would be a good place to try this out or incorporate it. Whereas, again, the concept art is to get um, local trees, again, to create this kind of promenade feature or gateway arch. Um, as an access point to the rest of the site. The next feature was focusing on things that are already kind of in the realm of expertise that MDI already has, um, which has to do with the incorporation of retention ponds, bio gardens, bio swales, um, and then also, sorry, rain gardens, not bio gardens, um, and then also just using local flora um, and native plants as a way to kind of absorb water on site and also attract local ecologies. So across the kind of edge over here, um, we've created plantings as a barrier because that's a very steep cliff right now if you look at the photo. Um, so instead of creating a fence, we wanted to use vegetation as a kind of natural barrier to prevent kids um, from essentially, again for safety reasons, kind of going off of that steep slope. Um, the other ways that we've tried to use this is to actually barricade the site from um, the kind of noise of the street. So we use plantings on this corner as a wraparound to be able to buffer the sound from the cars that are actually passing around that curve. A couple of other interventions that we're working on are just locating um, different areas for pollinator gardens that can attract bees and birds, sorry, butterflies, bees, and birds. Uh, as a way to kind of give back to the local ecology. So this is a sketch um, of a kind of typical cross-section of the way that we end up dealing with a lot of these bioswell ideas, um, which have to do, again, with using big rocks as a way to create continuous drainage and using local plants to be able to uh, absorb that water when it's passing through the bioswell. Another concept image of how this bioswale can actually kind of activate the color and the light um, on the site as an intervention piece to be able to kind of beautify the central park. And then a second concept image for that to kind of talk about how we can use that kind of local flora um, as a way to attract, again, animals, um, ecologies, um, and synthesize those things together as people are kind of using that as a congregation space. So setting up a series of seating kind of apparatuses or picnic tables um, so that people can again slow down, take in nature, and also coexist um, with the other kind of occupants of the site. The final thing that we got asked, <laughs> this has been like a very big point of contention. Um, it seems like it's very trendy at the moment with the youth to be biking, roller skating, skateboarding, um, I was making a joke the other day that they, they stopped playing soccer, but they use wheels now. They love being on wheels. Um, so we're starting to think about ways that we can actually create kind of a paved surface um, in the park as a way to create a loop for them um, to occupy something that's a bit more safe than moving them down towards the steep terrain at the bottom. So we decided that this plateau at the top um, kind of became a kid's zone 
with the structures that are already kind of existing there, um, and made for a natural loop that people can follow on their bikes, their roller skates, and their skateboards. So another concept image, kind of thinking about what that kind of paved surface might look like. And then the final thing had to do with very small interventions. So the idea was that we would kind of think about these things as zones, or preliminary zones to occupy. Um, and then we would give back the opportunity to artists and fabricators and makers to be able to make small interventions on the site to kind of create um, that, synth like that synthesis uh, with art and culture from the public domain. So the zones highlighted in red right now are meant to be kind of seating zones or bench areas. Um, there are a lot of ideas that we kind of had for this ourselves, uh, but we wanted to open it back up again to the community of makers that exist and the artists that exist um, to be able to use local materials and kind of bio-inspiration as a way to fill the site. So some previous kind of sketch examples that showed up um, a couple of months ago um, in conversations with other people had to do with kind of using the leaf um, as a motif um, that could exist on the site as a bench, which then as a kind of concept art could become sculpted um, and become a very kind of featured piece as a part of the Central Park, but would be something, again, that the artist could take on as a way to kind of create identity um, for that location. So this is the final kind of, I wouldn't say final, still in the works, <laughs> master plan, um, from kind of like feedback that we've already gotten from the community, things that we're working on, um, and multiple stakeholders that we've been partnering with to talk about how to move this forward. So, with that, we have a huge thank you to a lot of people. Um, there are dozens, if not more than dozens of people that have kind of played a part in getting this project to, um, for one, to the kind of start um, of the work and also for the amount of work that's happened over the past two months. So I don't have any photos of what it looks like right now because the goal is to kind of give you guys a surprise when you go down to site and go check out what's happening. Uh, but there's been multiple people there every day from nine to five, eight to five, seven to five, um, working on all these different structures, getting the site ready for this kind of next procedure. So we wanted to give a shout out to all these groups of people that have shown up at site to help us, that have given us donations, that have given us advice and counsel, um, and counsel, and then also funding to move the project forward. Cool. Thank you. Talk about how you get on and off the site. Yeah, I apologize for the lack of diagramming that's missing on here. There's some layers that didn't show up. So there are a couple of different entry points at the moment. Uh, one of them, the most kind of prominent that exists currently on the site, is the gate in the fence from the parking lot. Uh, they also are talking about two other strategies to kind of create an accessible route onto the site. One of them has to do with um, kind of opening up this back site as well as an entry point. And then developing a sidewalk along this site boundary, this one right here, to extend past. And then, so this would be another sidewalk that extends into the park. And then there are two other access points. One of them being this location right here, and then one across from what's going to be a bus stop is what we had heard. Uh -huh. So they're intervening, I think, just across the site to create a bus stop. So the idea is to create a kind of break in the tree line um, as another entrance from that public transport location or drop off zone. Pregunta yo tiene que ver con respecto a lo que son las entradas principales al parque como tal. De momento, una de las principales es de hecho un portón que existe acá que da conexión entre el parque, el parqueo trasero, el, el, el centro comercial y el parque como tal. <coughs> eh, está en negociación todavía, pero de momento ha sido la posición del centro comercial ha sido más extender esta acera para dar un acceso paralelo es una acera de 1.8 metros bastante amplia para dar acceso eh, más o menos directo entre el centro comercial 
y el parque, entendiendo que el parque no va a tener sanitarios, por ejemplo. Entonces, si alguien ocupa usar el baño, necesitaría ir al centro comercial. Eh, el segundo acceso estaría acá, que es un acceso más vehicular, de momento, para todo lo que ha sido el proceso de construcción, pero no se mantendría así. Tercero acceso podría estar en ese sector. Eh, la intención por ahí va a una, par una parada de buses, y si ese fuese el caso, tendría mucho sentido que haya algún tipo de cruce peatonal para movilizar a la gente desde la parada hasta el parque. Entonces, más o menos la, la propuesta. One other question, who, who owns this park? And is it public? Sí, eh, la pregunta de yo es, ¿quién, ¿quién es el dueño de este parque? Esa propiedad fue adquirida por el Consejo Municipal hace dos meses y qué, dos meses y una semana. Eh, el terreno había sido dueño del de, de consorcio que manejaba el centro comercial, pasó a manos del Banco Popular y fue adquirido por el, por el Consejo Municipal hace cerca de dos meses. Entonces, es terreno público, es el primer parque público de, de 5,000 metros wow. de terreno de la Sí. opportunities for us to look at, um, which one of them have to do with just putting them at the entry of the site so that when you're leaving off-site, um, you can actually take all that garbage with you, which is a pretty common practice typically now, um, is to kind of, when you're bringing anything extra onto site, it's to not leave a trace and kind of use that exit gate as a way to collect that material. Um, so the objective was to not house that onto the actual site location for now. I think was an idea because typically those receptacles end up spilling garbage all over the landscape. Um, so I think we would try to build a culture of just maintaining kind of this particular entrance zone as a way to kind of deal with that service um, ideology. Uh, whoever's responsible for that, I don't think I have an answer for that, and I think it's something that we have to negotiate with the municipality. Um, given that this is kind of under public domain, I would kind of assume that there are jurisdictions that they would have to take on terms of responsibility to keep the site clean. And this is a conversation that we've been starting to have, which is, um, we're actually starting to have this with a lot of products that we've built so far, uh, which is who is responsible for maintaining it, um, how do we create kind of ease of access to a lot of this so that you can clean it and maintain it, um, in the hopes that, for one, our first barrier is that nature is kind of cleaning up a lot of the things, um, not in terms of kind of the waste products that we produce, um, but just cleaning up the water to start, and that we would have to be responsible, like as a community, to kind of dive into those more ritual-based procedures um, to keep this something that's accessible and usable for everyone. Pregunta Fernanda relacionada con el manejo de basura y quién va a dar mantenimiento a la basura que va a estar en el lugar. Randy responde que la intención hasta el momento ha sido que no existan basureros en todo el sitio, sino que existan puntos estratégicos, especialmente en las salidas. De tal forma de que cuando usted entra con basura, al finalizar su estancia en el parque, esa basura no queda ahí, sino que usted la lleva a un punto final. Probablemente va a estar también vinculado al acceso al camión municipal, que sería que probablemente esté recogiendo eso, y tendría sentido de que sea ruta pública para poder tener fácil acceso a eso. Pero, pero son de, detalles importantes, y, y Randy menciona que también es un tema que hemos venido hablando en relación al mantenimiento de parques como tal, no solamente el parque central, pero parques que llevamos como teniendo varios puntos de intervención eh, que van a requerir de mantenimiento eh, constante. Y ya es algo conversación que también hemos tenido a nivel, bueno, con Jordi a nivel municipal, de que se nos está comenzando a ser grande el punto y que probablemente vamos a querer tener una persona casi que a tiempo completo para el mantenimiento de espacios públicos. Eh, el parque siendo no hechos. Yo no sé yo si usted quería entrar al, al respecto. No, justamente. Muchas gracias, muy bien. Justamente eh, es, el tema de los anejos residuos es algo que ya está en discusión. Algunos son de concepto de que, de que tengamos eh, depósitos para los residuos. Pero creo que vamos más por la línea en que cada uno sea responsable de un espacio para tratar de aire puro limpio y, y que no se vea como, como un lugar para ir a la jara. Y demás. 
eh, y estamos pensando que quizás para 2025 ya es una necesidad que no se puede postergar de tener un, un encargado de partes para este y para todos los que tenemos convenios, porque los demás, solo uno es propiedad del gobierno local, que es el de la colina. Todos los demás son convenios de, de préstamo, de terreno, pero ya no damos abasto para dar mantenimiento, porque el mantenimiento que, lo da, que damos lo hacemos con mano de obra de otros departamentos que lo hacen a honor. Entonces, la instalación va en ese sentido. Quizás ahora viendo ahí el dibujo y vemos la línea negra que divide el parqueo, tal vez a nivel de aclarar que la línea está más metida todavía. Ahí hay aproximadamente 500, 600 metros cuadrados que están en las zonas verdes del parqueo que pertenecen al terreno. Estamos en esas conversaciones para eh, definir el tema de la malla. Prioritariamente nosotros diríamos que no hubiera malla, pero eh, hay una resistencia importante de los propietarios de los inmuebles en el centro comercial para no tener un, una, una línea totalmente libre de, de, de malla. Entonces, por ahí estamos en esas conversaciones y, y muy próximamente vamos a, a tener eso. Lo otro es que hay un plan máster o un plan maestro de diseño que está haciendo el Centro Municipal de Urbanismo Social de la NAI, la Asociación de Alcaldes Incidentes, donde están haciendo este trabajo. Ya está listo el material, posiblemente en una semana, 15 días, estarían entregados y a partir de ahí empezamos a buscar la, la, el recurso para eh, construir o diseñar lo que queremos. Estas primeras estructuras están contempladas dentro de ese diseño para no no ir a cambiar nada, o cambiarlo solo si así el uso del espacio lo va a ir demostrando. Perdón por hacerlo tan Gracias, Manuel. No, no, so just, just summarizing a little bit of what Jody was, was explaining on what, at once, I mean, the service that, that, that goes in the line with what Bradley was saying, the idea is that people are actually responsible for what they take in the park. Most likely there will have to be something there, but I mean, ideally, um, it wouldn't be the main purpose of the park itself, the service is a place to put your, your stuff. That's number one. Number two is, is a clar um, clarifying that the, this border over here is actually slightly different um, from what the edge looks like. It more like comes from this corner over here, kind of like cross here. Um, so the terrain itself adds um, around 500 meters more. So the fence, there's actually existing fence in this perimeter over here, will be moving from there. Um, again, there is a resistance from the Apparently there's a resistance from the people that are there in the Centro Comercial. We've been talking about that and, and we believe that the use of the park will be eventually tell the, the commercial potential that this has. I think they need to see it in working and, and to realize how important would this be for the, for the Centro Comercial and how much would they be losing if they are actually closing that. Um, it can activate a lot of the, the economy in, in the Centro Comercial itself, but I mean it will happen to happen um, um, in the years to come. Um, a third point, and it's an important point, there is another group uh, from the um, Centro Municipal de Urbanismo Social. Centro Municipal de Urbanismo Social. So it's a, it's a, it's a branch um, from the local or um, local governments in, in Costa Rica that is also preparing another, another master plan that is incorporating um, a lot of what you saw in terms of the, in terms of the structures as soon as presented. Um, and many other elements. So the idea is that once we get this in, in place, um, we'll start looking for the resources, including um, a person that will do maintenance, not only for this part, but also for the other parts. This will start working in 2025, um, ideally having this person. Um, there are two parts that are owned by the municipality and um, the other rest have some sort of a arrangements with the owners of the of the land, whether it's a, as an individual or like an association de desarrollo, like in the case of Sanguis, for example. Um, so that is, is part of what you say. Algún otro comentario, duda? Yo creo que muchos van a responder una vez que vayamos allá abajo, ahí van a poder ver un poco en función. Es el miedo. El terreno tiene una particularidad y es que está afectado por una zona de protección. Entonces, eh, eh, ubicar estructuras permanentes, incluyendo sanitario, por ejemplo, no va a ser una posibilidad. Si sí, se está contemplando el hecho de que haya una o más tomas de agua eh, para, que, para que la gente pueda tener agua potable, 
eh, no se ha definido el lugar todavía en gran parte porque el terreno tiene que comenzar a funcionar para más o menos verlo y eso es una de las cosas que hemos hablado con Chelsea, primero ver cómo trabaja el parque a partir de lo que ya existe para tomar decisiones puntuales de qué deberían ser los siguientes pasos hasta cierto punto el usuario es el que termina definiendo en dónde y cómo podría funcionar mejor este lugar So the question is related to um, whether we can install toilets or not, um, or water, portable water, and somebody described that this particular site as, a, as something that is, uh, is protected um, by, this, by, the, by the fact that there is a spring, and so there is a buffer of 200 meters around the spring. So you cannot build any permanent structures on the scale of a bathroom, for example, in particular a bathroom if you're going to have a, um, like if it's a septic system, for example. But no matter what, I mean, the structures will be um, pretty much restricted there. Um, that being said, the idea is to have portable water on the side, so that is something that will be put in place uh, eventually. This is not, we don't know yet how the park is working because we're opening today. So we want to see how people interact with the space and start defining some specific arrangements based on the use um, or what the users are going to dictate of the space itself. Sí, hay, hay, hay un montón de temas asociados, ese y el de iluminación. Sí, 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 definitivamente en algún momento va a tener que ser la respuesta a eso. Eso y otro montón de puntos vamos a tener que seguirlos en, 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 en seguimiento a, a, al parque como tal. El tema de seguridad a partir de luz, a partir de cámaras, a partir de, de uso del espacio como tal, inclusive patrullajes, etcétera, etcétera. Son un montón de elementos que se ha pensado o no se ha profundizado, o sea, no existe como una propuesta. Yo, yo diría eso, yo, yo no sé si diría lo opuesto, todavía no tenemos algo como propuesta concreta de cómo vamos a manejarlo. Sin duda alguna, y en base a la experiencia de otros parques, es clave tener iluminación y es clave tener cámaras de seguridad, especialmente porque va a ser un sitio abierto, abierto las 24 horas. Entonces, eh, si viene en las horas de la noche, pues ya la idea es que sea un espacio que siga siendo seguro, ¿verdad? No, no lo puedes. The question goes in the lines of whether uh, we have visualized the idea of having cameras in place or, or and I said, well, I extended this to light to lighting itself in the, in the place. And, um, and we know there is a list of things within the, the idea of bringing safety to the park itself that we need to address. There is not a plan per se yet uh, in place. Um, we lack of resources. Um, I need haven't checked my final numbers, but I bet I need to go back to the community and ask for a lot of funding just to pay what we invested. Um, but in the future, more investment will be needed, and that includes more better lighting so that people will be there. This is open, this is a 24-7 park. So the idea is that people will go there and feel safe no matter what time you go. Um, and so, yeah, surveillance cameras will be helpful there as, as well as having good illumination throughout the park. I'm, I'm, I'm truly pleased with the, the concept of, of a large park as a public space for um, the community. Um, I'm also struck by the kinds of questions you get with vague uh, kind of understanding the relationship between the design, the maintenance, and the programming of the park. If it's to be 24-7, who gives it planned and how? All of those things get negotiated. For many of the large park systems in the United States, there are conservatories or park organizations that are supported often by the commercial interest to benefit from them. So that negotiation with the central seems really important. Uh, and then concurrently, the, the municipal responsibilities, and then overall, the grass that takes care of everything, who decides when that plaza is activated uh, and how, and when there's competing interests, how are they negotiated. It becomes a community living room that has to have a system of negotiation mm -hmm. that drives it. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those places that I, I love in architecture, which is that the architecture and the organizational structure each inform the other. And so doing it and then bringing the maintenance and operation as opposed to starting and letting an organizational structure inform 
operation, maintenance, and program, along with all the community interest in activation, is part of the opportunity going forward to bring this park fully to life. But I can just, uh, among other things, I think it's just a splendid concept of a, of a brand central park presentation. Well, se refiere a un par de aspectos importantes en relación al parque y uno de ellos es eh, menciona que en muchos casos en los estados por lo menos hay organizaciones detrás, hay un comité de parques que hasta cierto punto no solamente vela por el mantenimiento y demás, sino ante las decisiones con respecto al uso del parque y demás, eh, qué espacios se activan y demás. En gran parte de esos comités trabajan en colaboración con el espacio comercial que tiene intereses muy dirigidos con respecto al uso de ese parque porque son alrededor de un parque, un espacio público se comienza a dinamizar mucho la economía entonces existe un, un, una relación muy, muy directa entre el uso del parque y, y, el, y el sector comercial que se mantiene ahí presente y él ve una oportunidad grande en el caso de este parque de comenzar ese tipo de negociación directamente con el centro comercial que, es el, que está adyacente y va a prestar servicios para ver cómo podemos integrar y tener más sinergia digamos, entre el uso del parque y, eh, y y el centro comercial en este caso, y digamos con, con, eh, como actores claves que van a estar integrados en, en el mantenimiento, en quién corta el pasto, en cómo se van a activar las zonas, en qué zonas se activan primero, en dónde debería convertirse el presupuesto, en cámaras, en luz, en agua, en una zona o la otra, digamos, como ese tipo de cosas de, 